Hello and welcome to a special Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast episode, our 199.5 bonus episode. We're back and getting ready for episode 200. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and you should come join us in the lobby, our chat room. So we're back. Tonight, we're going to go through some viewer feedback, hype up our 200th episode, which we should be recording next week. So I'm not going to promise you anything after this the last time. Uh, we're going to let you know where we've been, answer three shorter questions, reveal Dolce from Stronghold Games, and talk about the games we played since we last recorded which isn't all that much, at least on my part. We're going to start this off, though, by digging into the suggestion box. Welcome to the suggestion box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with our listeners, viewers, and readers. Up first, here's a comment from Patrick on our topic of oddball games back on episode 198. Probably the most unique game I own is The Lark Lamp by Lumo Azumo. It's played in a dim or dark room and uses light and shadow to project the board onto the tabletop. Well, thanks for the comment, Patrick. Now, Patrick included some pictures with his comment, and I wish I kind of shared them here. If Sean and I had had more time to prepare for this week, I probably would have sent them to him so he could have flashed them up on the screen here for those of you watching on YouTube or here live on Twitch. And I got to say, this just looks cool. It's actually a lantern that goes in the middle of your table. It's a four-sided lantern. That is actually a few different games in one because you can actually the, the board is the lamp and you can replace the shades on the four different sides to make different shaped boards. I, I, that is just so cool and unique. And I don't think this one goes too far because that was the other part of our episode is some oddball games that take it a little too far. I don't think it does. I would love to check this out and just have a copy on hand downstairs in my game room specifically set aside for when the power goes out on game night. I assume then that the lamp it uses is battery powered. Uh, it's LED light. They, right. they, I, I have a feeling a real candle with these plastic sleeves to make the board could be a bad combination. Oh, so it's like that the uh, the one the the game where you the shadows in the in the forest game that we were talking about in that same. Well, movie. sort of. Except this is the board. This goes yeah. in the middle of the table with a light in it, and that light then projects through the screens that are on the four sides to make a board. And in that one, the, in that case, the LED could actually be a better, whereas yes. in, the, in the, the Shadows in the Forest game, the LED light actually kind of ruined the game because yeah. it wasn't. You want the flickering, <laughs> you want the flickering and, the, and the sharpness of a, of a smaller light source than the LED gives you. Yes. All right. Well, we got another comment on that podcast episode, but it wasn't about oddball games. It was about our bells. Pablo so, pa yep. oh. so Pablo42 wrote. On earphones or car stereo, the bell sound on the intro is a bit higher than the rest of the podcast. Not sure if you can level them out, not having to adjust the volume. Sometimes I forget and blast my ears. Laugh out loud. Thanks for the content. Now, I will note that we do, they were actually the same level. The, we did some testing and we checked it out. And Sean was leveling every episode. So they weren't actually louder than anything else, but they were higher pitched. Right, so they were a little on the shrill side, and since receiving this, we redid the bells completely in order to try and minimize the annoyance from the bells, which are a rather iconic aspect of our brand. Yeah, we actually sat there and debated getting rid of them, and like everyone I talked to was like, no, you need the bells, you gotta have the bells, the bells have to be in the pictures, see, you got one in the back there, we gotta have the bells, the bells are your, that, they're our symbol, and people know us by our bells, so we had to keep the bells. Now, for those of you who are listening and even here live, I think you're using them in the live show now too, right? Uh, no, they still aren't oh. in the live. Oh, they aren't in the live show yet. So we haven't quite finished putting them into everything. But those of you listening to the podcast, um, they're on the YouTube videos though, are they not? Yes, YouTube and yes. podcast were replaced. Yeah, YouTube and podcast. So what I want to know, uh, how, how, how do you, what do you think? Is, is this better? Um, I'd specifically love to hear back from Pablo if they're any better since it did bother them. Um, or did you even notice? Which if you didn't, great. Well, up next, Brad Murray, probably best known for his RPGs Hollow Point and Diaspora, commented on our Drop It review to say, Great review, folks. Thank you. Definitely going to have a look at this for the next time I'm in my FLGS. Well, thanks, Brad, for the comment and for supporting your FLGS. I hope they had a copy. 
Now, if you can't get it locally, just hit me up. I'll find you a good price online, as finding game deals is one of the many concierge services I offer. Now, a few other people took the time to leave comments on that review, including Brian Everett, who said, Love Drop It, fantastic game for anyone. And Caitlin Domey, who said, Another thing we must own. Laugh out loud. <laughs> well, thanks, Brian and Kat. Well, next, a couple of comments on our Once Upon a Line review. Lino Pang just jumped in to say, so the replay value is minimal. And longtime fan Chris Groff said, sounds interesting, but not sure it's interesting enough to bite. Maybe if it's retail and still holds my interest. Great review, though. Well, thanks for the comments, Lino and Chris. Uh, Lino's right. The replay value here to me is null and void. Uh, well, they do charge sell recharge packs. You can get recharge packs with the Kickstarter. They are going to be available in retail after the fact. I think that's mainly so you can kind of resell your copy or pass it on to a friend. Like, I can't see replaying anything we saw in that game unless many years have gone by. And even then, I think you're going to start playing and your memory is going to trigger and you're going to spoil it for yourself anyway. Now, what I do want to note about Once Upon a Line, which is important since we haven't been around to point it out, uh, this game did go on to successfully punt, fund. So Once Upon a Line should become a reality, and I am looking forward to hearing what people think of a full scenario, because all we got to play was the tutorial and one prologue. Well, let's wrap up with a couple of comments on our Boba Mahjong review. Jekko writes, nice vid. Kind of saw the overly complicated scoring coming since it is called <laughs> Mahjong. Sounds like a cute game. And Nico Mraid commented, not strictly Mahjong, but it's cute. I want to reblog it. Well, thanks, Jekko, and I think it's Ni Comrade. Thank you very much for those. Uh, as for the argument, is it Mahjong? I don't know. What is Mahjong? Doesn't, isn't Mahjong Chinese basically just for set collection, and doesn't it apply to a bunch of different things? Unless Ni Comrade is thinking of the matching two style of Mahjong, which isn't Mahjong. As for this game, you know what? It's set collection. It's a set collection card game. The name's cute, and the boba theme obviously goes with it. Um, now that second comment, uh, the one from the comrade actually came from Tumblr, which is a social account I've had since G plus closed, but started using once again, once people started fleeing Twitter, this is actually our first comment we've gotten over there. And I'm glad to see it. It means at least someone's paying attention and it's worth sharing over there. If you are on Tumblr, you can follow me, you know, my social media tag everywhere, tabletop bellhop, one word. Well, that's it for this week's comments. We always love it when you comment on our posts. Email mo at tabletopbellhop.com or reach out on social media. Well, besides the fact we're back and should be on a regular schedule going forward with a steady stream of content coming out in the coming weeks, the other big thing we need to announce is what's up with our 200th episode. Yeah, and unfortunately, stuff hit the fan the week before we were going to record that special episode, and everything's been on hold since. Uh, due to the fact we've got some big plans for that episode, including a fantastic giveaway with some great sponsors, we didn't want to suddenly pop back online tonight without any heads up and get right into that 200th episode. We want to make sure as many people as possible know about our 200th episode special. So we wanted to give everyone a week's notice before recording that one. And honestly, I probably would have gave it two weeks notice, but I'm not sure we can really squeeze in two special episodes without messing up our timing and, and numbering system any worse than it already is. So right now, assuming nothing else drastic or tragic happens in the next seven days, the plan is to record the 200th episode on Wednesday, March the 8th, right here on Twitch, twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop at our usual time of 9 p.m. Eastern. That's New York or Toronto time. Now that episode, we'll be sharing our top 25 games of right now. A new list for me, as I've never actually put this one together before. I think this is going to be fascinating. I am really looking forward to hearing Sean's list because now he's played more than 25 games. Because I, I think when we started this podcast, I'm not even sure if he could have done it top 25. And this is one I, I had to, to look this up. I haven't actually did that. We had an episode where it was my top 25 games of right now based on one of the questions we got. It was the second question we ever got, and we did it in 2018, the year we started this podcast. So last time I did a top, I actually, I'm, I'm doing a top 100 list, but I'm, we're only going to share a top 25. The last time I did this was 2018. So I am expecting this new list to be quite different from the old one. And it's going to be really interesting to see where games have moved. Uh, if I have the time, I'm going to try to 
reference both so I can say, you know, that's up two or that's down 25 or that's new to the list. Now, after that, we're probably going to spend the bulk of the episode just hanging out with the folks that join us live in the chat room, maybe answering some questions. Now, during the event, we're going to be giving away some small door prizes as thanks you for to anyone who joins us that day. Now, these are going to be like small board game promos, cards, small geeky things and items like that. More importantly, I think to most people, though, we are going to launch our biggest ever board game and RPG giveaway ever. This one really is going to be epic. We reached out to a number of publishers we've started uh, that we've worked with since starting the show and asked them if they'd be willing to help us celebrate by donating games to our giveaway. We thought it would be extra cool if the go games they donated were games we reviewed before and a surprising number of publishers were totally on board. So huge thanks ahead of time to, and get ready for this, The Op, Brand the Gamers Guild, Escape Welt, Ulysses Spiel, Puzzling Pursuits, Free League Publishing, Rebel Studios, Unidragon, Good Games Publishing, Hidden Industries, and Japanime Games. Thank all of you for being part of our show and supporting our 200th anniversary. You are all awesome. So don't miss out on this huge event, March 8th. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. Working with you to make your game nights better. All right, tonight, due to a longer than usual, totally unexpected absence, we're going to mix things up just a bit. For this segment, we're going to let you know where we are and where we were, sorry, and where we're going next, and then follow up by answering a few short questions from our mailbag. So we have an official Ask the Bellhop, and we are answering your questions. These are questions that just weren't big enough or, or too focused to fill a full episode. So, of course, the big question I expect is on all of our listeners' and viewers' minds is, what happened? Where did you go? Yes. Which is fully understandable, as we are right in the closing stretch leading up to episode 200, getting people hyped for three weeks in a row, and then nothing. Silence. Uh, well, Deanna sent out some emails and Sean managed to put some tweets online, I think for the most part, for the average person or average listener, we just stopped for no good reason. Well, we're here to let you know that we did not pod fade. We didn't make it all the way to 199 just to stop without any announcement or anything like that. We care too much to do that to you. Yeah, no, not at all. And 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 we have no plans on stopping now. At 200th episode, I hope to celebrate our 300th, 500th. 600th maybe our thousandth episode who knows recorded from the retirement home at that point possibly um what actually happened is my family after almost three years of playing it safe and following all of the health unit's recommendations finally caught COVID-19 and not positive but asymptomatic COVID either full-on high fever causing hallucinations um dialing um telehealth Ontario moments from calling an ambulance COVID once that hit no one was in any shape to send out a notification other than a few quick tweets and posts on social media. Yeah, well, I would have loved to have like just put out something saying, hey, we caught COVID, we'll be back. This was bad, and it's lasted forever. Um, I had the worst of it, but all five members of my immediate family had it, and everyone spent multiple days in bed recovering. Even now, my mom and I still have a bit of a lingering cough, and I don't think it's happened yet, but I do apologize if I fail to catch any of them by muting tonight, and you have to listen to me cough. COVID is not done and over with, people. Mask up and stay safe. Now, once things did start to look better for all of us, we got more bad news medically. Uh, Deanna was suddenly having vision problems, and after getting that checked out, it ends up she had a torn retina in one of her eyes, most likely caused by severe coughing from COVID. This eventually led to emergency laser eye surgery which props to the local eye doctors in Windsor for getting her in as quickly as we did. Now, while most people know Deanna is part of the team and recognize her as a moderator, she does a lot more work behind the scenes than I think most people think or expect. Yeah, and it's not just editing my work so I don't sound like an idiot <laughs> due to uh, various, various disabilities I have with letters and words. Um, of importance in this particular case, though, is she's the one that sets up and runs all our giveaways. She's the one that knows how to get Rafflecopter to work and does all the cross-linking and promotion. So even if Sean and I were doing well, we still needed her to be able to set things up for episode 200. 
To make things even more complicated, I also came down with a head cold, thankfully not COVID, but enough reason to postpone recording for one more week. Yeah, so basically, we are all good to go. We are ready for episode 200 and then got hit by medical issues we're still recovering from even today. At this point, Deanna is still dealing with her eye surgery and the fallout from that. She's still having vision problems. And all of us have some lingering cold-like symptoms, but not enough to keep us from recording tonight. And no, we're no longer contagious. You see us out and about, you don't have to run away. In fact, I was out getting this haircut for the 200th episode when I got the news that COVID had hit the family. Yes. <laughs> I feel bad. Sean got a special haircut for our 200th episode. That's not something I'm going to be doing. Now, we're counting on the fact everything and everyone will heal up nicely so that everything's good to go for next week. It better be at this point. Now, I will say while recovering, once I was feeling better to be on the computer for a bit, I did manage to get out a few unboxing videos on the blog, which is something I do now and then. I put up copies of our unboxing videos on the blog with a short description. That's mainly for SEO purposes, but at least something was coming out. So if anyone visited the page, the last post wasn't from January. Um, I did get out one YouTube unboxing as well as well as two YouTube reviews, because it was stuff that we had kind of saved up. And our reviews are already delayed a week for YouTube, so at least there was something to get out of there. So once I was feeling over, we were able to trickle that out. Now, at this point, I do have one more unboxing way to go out. Uh, it should have went up today. Uh, I was hoping for today, but today was a day of interruptions, and it just didn't happen. Um, and I actually started working on a new article um, based on running Super's RPGs, which is shows just how many articles I could use to catch up on at some point. So I've been, I was working with Sean on that a little bit. Um, in the coming weeks, I, things should get back on track. Um, for example, as part of tonight's show, later on the, on tonight, we're going to review Dolce from Stronghold Games. Uh, the written review for that should go live this weekend, and then the video will be next week. So everything should be on track for that. I actually got more games in than Mo for a change. Yes. As with the lockdown at their house, I went out to help out with the local event at the barbershop bar. Yeah, that's the other problem is it's, here we are started up. I'm hosting public play events again. It's awesome. And I already had to cancel. And unfortunately, I'm going to also miss the one uh, this month because we're going to be out of town for Deanna's birthday. So locals, uh, another little heads up here for those of you paying attention. The next event will be on March 11th at the Barbershop Bar, though, again, I will not be attending. But I do I have a couple of bags of games that will probably show up <laughs> there. So show, hopefully Sean will show up and, and take my place. Now, as for me in gaming, it's been almost nothing. Like, I, I, I jumped on Board Game Geek today because I do that before every podcast episode so I can talk about the games we played since the last time we recorded. Well, it's been months. It was January 25th the last time we recorded, and I looked it up, and, and I'm like, oh, man, it looks terrible. So for anyone who's listened to our recent episodes heard me all excited about how I played more games in January of 2023. So, like, more games this year than I played every month of last year and i'm like oh it's gonna be so much better this year than last year well in february i played one one game and when i played it last night on the 28th the last day of the month i got in one game this month that just goes to show how lousy everyone was feeling like it wasn't even like a sit up we didn't even play video games because it's just like video games were too much work yeah. uh, it was rough all right well enough about where we've been it's time to move on to something new Yes. For the rest of this segment, we're going to answer a few questions from our mailbag that are a little too easy, specific, or short to dedicate an entire episode to. Now, here's one that seems especially appropriate for tonight. <laughs> Amanda Stumantis L. writes, Okay, sign of the times type of question. What is a great game for a 10-year-old to enjoy with their grandparents via a Zoom call over the winter? Looking to spice up COVID cold and flu season visits for everyone. Now, this actually might be an evergreen topic I return to with just because I have a feeling we're going to have COVID cold and flu season every year going forward. Now, it's it's probably just going to be endemic and one of those things we have to deal with and we all get shots for every year. So this might turn into a full topic, but at this point, I figured it'd be nice and short. Um, so what the first game that came to my mind, I didn't do a ton of research on this one. It's kind of off the cuff stuff I just thought of while typing out the question earlier today was monstrosity because that game I saw people play over zoom and I think it was 99 people played. It was ridiculous. It was the, um, uh, crystal Dax from the board game, our game spotlight. Oh my God. I feel so bad. I can't remember. It's short, short episodes they are only like 15 minutes long board game. Oh, I can't believe I can't remember. 
It's Crystal and Ambi. I apologize, Crystal, for totally blanking board on the name Blitz. of your show. Blitz. Thank you. I'm like short thing. Blitz. Board Game Blitz. Uh, from the Board Game Blitz podcast. Now, I don't remember if Crystal, this was part of the Board Game Blitz podcast or something she was doing on her own or with the Dice Tower. Crystal's kind of all over the place. Um, but they sat and described the monster and everyone at home just had like a sheet of white paper and drew what they were describing and then all held it up to their webcams. And then whoever was the awesome person in the back room who was controlling all the cameras and stuff showed some of the best. So that was my first thought was was monstrosity, I think, would be great, especially a 10 year old. Right. We got a 10 year old playing with grandparents. Grandparents, I'm sure, can describe monsters and can draw well enough as a 10 year old. Yep. Uh, and I think the next one that comes to mind is the one that we've played online and we've had fun with both, uh, you know, individually and as groups. That's Codenames Duet with the yeah. code name, with their own uh, their own website. Yeah, it's the codenamesonline.com or something. I, I will throw a link to this in the show notes. Here's proof that I didn't do research tonight. See, when we do an ask, I usually do research and Google all this stuff and find links. No, sorry. <laughs> We're still not 100%. And it's codenames.game. Codenames.game where you can play regular codenames or duet. So, yes, that's not necessarily over Zoom, but I don't see any reason that you couldn't play Codenames Duet over Zoom because of its cooperative nature. You should be able to play that game with a fairly simple web uh, webcam setup um what i would recommend is if you can have clue cards at both ends and don't necessarily use like the fronts and backs of the like you know what i mean so you can can kind of match them up but really you you probably can play it like like just go to codenamesgames.net i already Co forgot codenames.games thank you codenames.games and play that way uh one i saw strongly recommended is patchwork doodle which is a, a roll and write game where you're you're uh, well flip and write where you're getting patchwork patches that you then draw in on your board. And another one would be oh so clever, which is the extremely popular um, uh, Wolfgang Warsh roll and write. And honestly, all roll and writes. I, I can't think of a roll and write that doesn't fit this because everyone just needs their own sheets. And most roll and writes, you can get the sheets online for free. That's most of them, but most companies provide PDF versions of their roll and write sheets for you to print out. So just one person has to own the game and roll the dice, and then everyone else goes online, prints out whatever copies they need, and then you can play whatever roll and write. Well, and, and the other option, of course, is with, with Board Game Arena, you set up a Zoom call, have Board Game Arena open in the corner, and you've got, yes. uh, you know, Railroad Inc. is on uh, Board Game Arena now, for instance. Yep. Well, at Board Game Arena, honestly, like instead of codenames.game, just go to Board Game Arena. You can play almost any game. You can play anything online. I, I, a 10 year old? Eh. Well, that, that's um, why that's uh, why I was sticking with, with the, you know, uh, railroad. Well, I, I was just trying to think of some quick Board Game Arena games for a 10 year old. I can't stop. Um, sushi Go, Sushi Go Party, um, Go Nuts for Donuts, which you play. Yep. Um, possibly Azul. That might be something that might hook the grandparents a little more that a 10 year old can play. My 10 year old, when she was 10, could play it. Well, even just something as simple as Haggis, right? It's just yep. basically, you know, basic card games and such uh, where you don't have to worry about, you know, two different decks in two different locations. You've got one deck yeah. online. One deck online. That's true. Um, one I saw, so I did do a little bit of research on this. I just Googled it to see what people's top list. The top of the list for almost everyone was Welcome to, which I know was another flip and right. Welcome to is a game I need to try. I've never actually played it. I've heard really good things. But I'll admit, I kind of stay away from roll and write games. I hadn't really been wowed by any. That is until we played Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, which Dice Kingdoms of Valeria I don't recommend. Uh, not for a 10 year old and grandparents. No, I, no. I, a 10 year old and grandparents mean means non gamer. So if they happen to be 10 year old gamer and gaming grandparents, go for it. But. And Welcome to and Welcome to Las Vegas are both on BGA. Yeah. So again, <laughs> uh, another one that, that works is the, the basically Werewolf or any of the social deduction games. Especially if you got the moderator. So if you're doing ten year old with grandparents, you have the parent play moderator, sure. um, and then you can play through those games. Now the only problem with Werewolf is you need quite a few players. So so I don't know how many people are in the family for this to work. So you, you need you need a fairly big group. Um, I am not a fan of Werewolf, so I couldn't even tell you what the minimum player count is. But I have to assume it's more than two or three, right. probably like four or five. Uh, but then One Night Ultimate Werewolf or uh, The Resistance or some of the other social deduction games I think would work well. Uh, One Night Ultimate Werewolf is three plus. So it's three, three plus. Three to so ten. There you go, three. three. Uh, wow. How do you play that? They recommend four to ten is, uh, is community. Okay. Best is six to eight. Yeah. So, but, but recommend four. So that's not bad. Yeah. 
Um, the other thing is, is word games tend to work well, word based party games. Uh, the one I call out is trap words. But you know what I would do is I would just ditch the whole dungeon, defeat the monster, get cursed part. I would just play. I, basically, you'd be playing taboo where the other team picks the words you can't say. That That's what I would do. I, I would modify trap words. Um, what's what's the other one? No, letter jam wouldn't work well with Zoom, I don't mm, think. No, that would be no. What is it? What's the other game I got with trap words? Same time from CGE. Was it letter jam? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, they came at the same yeah. time. So, and no, that one doesn't work. I, there's another word game that I swear will work, but I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Um, one that would be a lot of fun is super cats. There, there's your, you know, 10 year old <laughs> because only one player needs to see all the cards. Like, yes, technically. The grandparents would need five cards in front of them that flip to their Super Sentai side. But like you could use anything. You you could right. just use playing cards, right? That are all on their, their backside and you flip them over to the right side. But then the player, the the, the main player is gonna have to build Robo Dog out of the actual cards for the game. Uh, breakdancing Meeple would probably work if as long as you had two copies of the game. There are quite a few that if you each had a copy of the game. Yeah, I think it's easier, probably best to try and avoid that, though, if necessary. Yeah. Like, I'm sure the grandparents aren't going to want to have a bunch of games that they <laughs> they That's sit around true. and only that they only play when they're when they're talking to their kids on Zoom. Uh, tech is saying uh, Tiny Towns done over Zoom. He's seen people do it, so that's pretty cool. Um, the what? other thing I would strongly recommend, uh, as long as your grandparents are open to it, maybe don't tell them that's what it is, is play an RPG. Like any type of RPGs work great online. And you're thinking 10 year old, like go, go to the simple ones, right? Like, like magical kitties save the day. Uh, even the D and D adventure begins. You go buy a copy of that. All you need is a D 20 and technically anyone can roll online, but you just send them a link to an A online roller. Yep. There's millions of them. There's tons of them. You don't have to pay for send them an online roller and run them through a, a very descriptive one. Medium. Uh, that could be interesting. Medium would work again, though. You need. No, you'd only need one copy. Yeah, of the you cards. only need one copy. You only need one, except for the whole. No, because you're supposed to play a card, right? Mm. You're picking a card from your hand to pair with what's up. So that would require two copies of the game. I think it would work, but you'd need two copies, like multiple copies of the game. Street magic with Trello for the cards. I don't know. I'm sorry. Did you say street magic? I don't know that one. Not a game I know. So Jeff pull up, Jeff Jeff living up to his reputation and pulling out the indie game I've never heard of. I'm sorry. Did you say Street Magic? Um, strong recommended for for the Queen, but I don't think you want to play that with ten year olds. Mm, fair. Like I I would strongly recommend that one if it was an eighteen year old trying to play with Zoom with their parents. Maybe I don't even know. That it's, one doesn't quite right. I, there's got it. Did anyone make a kids version of for the Queen yet? I'm like, I don't know sure. what it's for the Scoopy snacks or something. I you based on how many different for the Queens there are out there. I would be shocked if there aren't. I'd, I, I can't remember. What there's that, gotta be. I can't, a, there's a that one version. website that sort of collects all the different for the Queens. And I mm -hmm. can't remember what that site is right now. But um, it was funny. You were, you were mentioning uh, Roland rights earlier and thinking of um, Railroad Inc. Uh, and that got played at the uh, at the barbershop bar. Uh, nice. And yet again, I, I discussed it with the people there and no one I have ever met has uses actually the used the extra dice. I've never. Someone that Nobody. owns a game is going to, I'm going to play it with them. They're going to use the dang blue dice or red dice or green dice or yellow dice or Cthulhu dice. <laughs> nobody's yes. ever done. Nobody's ever used the bonus dice. Yeah. I, I honestly don't know what any of them do because I don't own the games myself. Yeah. Sure. And I have played tons of games with the normal because that, that's one you can play online. There is a, a free version of Railroad Rink online where you can choose which dice to use. And you can play it solo. So I played many times and just tried to beat my own score kind of thing. Yeah, Tech was even at that table. Like, nope, no yeah. bonus dice. No bonus. I, yeah, I, I actually Tech had, we had talked on Facebook and that was the first thing I asked. Did you use bonus dice? It's like, nope, no <laughs> bonus dice. I'm like, no one, no one yeah. uses. Scott, you listening? I don't know. Does Scott listen to our podcast? Scott, know. bring out, the, Scott's probably the one who brought. Railroad oh yeah, no, he was. It was Scott. Yeah, and I asked see, him, I was gonna say, but, he, but I asked him and he said, no, I've never used that. <laughs> Scott's never used him. He's had that game for like six years. <laughs> so I played it with Scott like the well, yeah, weekend that, it came out. Yeah, that was the CG the, Realm. Same here. I was there and that was the yeah. first time I'd ever that, that was the only time I've ever played Railroad Inc. in person wow. was uh was that time from with Scott's copy. 
No one else would work. Was is any of these games that we're going to be talking about later the bingo style games, which I, someone else coined that term, and I'm like, you know what? It actually fits, right? Because you call out the thing, and then everyone uses. So all the games where someone calls out a thing, and then everyone finds that same card or that same piece or that same resource, and then uses that to do something. So that's why Tiny Towns works. But I honestly like we're going to be talking about Dolce later. But again, ten year old, I don't know if a ten year old would get I Dolce would not. and non gaming grandparents. No, because Dolce is heavy. But that style of game. So number nine, there, there's my recommendation. Number nine can play as many people as you have pieces. And I know people who have bought four copies of the game to be able to play it with a classroom full of people. Cause I think each copy plays four players and this let you get to 16 players. So number nine, which is I, I'm saying number nine, but it's N M B R nine with no space. If you're trying to find that on the Googles <laughs> or board game geek, uh, one, I listened to a lot of podcasts. So that is one of the things I did when I wasn't feeling good is I sat and listened to podcasts and like, for me, I, I am way more caught up than usual, but I'm still way behind. And I listened to an episode about dumb game names. And while number nine was on that list, because it's, it's not a bad name based on the gameplay. But when you try to like order it or you go into a game store and you're like, Hey, can you get number nine? And you don't know that it's N M B R nine. They're like, they're like, yeah, hobby gamers think it's cute. And people are on board game geek know it, but like the average person Who's hearing, here's a great game to play with my 10 year old. Hey, I was listening to Tabletop Bellhop the other day and I heard about this great game to play with my 10 year old and their grandparents should like it. Can you get me in a copy of number nine? And then like the game store owner like only sells Magic Gathering cards, so doesn't know board games and jumps on to the Alliance website and is like, no, sorry, I can't I can't seem to find that game. Don't do that, publishers. Yeah. For more reasons than you did, like it's it's not just just trying to spell it. it there, there are multiple reasons you shouldn't do that. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, really, we, I think we covered that one pretty uh, thoroughly. Yeah, there you go. I, I think we're good. I, like I said, I might at some point deep dive this a little more, but it was pretty specific with the 10 year old grandparents and zoom calls. All right. Well, here's more of a philosophical one instead of a game recommendation one. Yep. Gagan China asks, Board game question, not sure if you did an article on this, but Catan is quite popular. I've only played it one years ago myself, but gamer groups rarely play it. Why is that? So I think what, what Guggen's really asking here is why do people hate Catan, right? Like it's it's listed as a top, I don't know where it is on Board Game Geek. Where is it on Board Game You can look that up while yep, I'm talking. Yep. I wonder where it is on Board Game Geek right now because it's it, it's old. Why why all the hate, right? Like like I, obviously Guggen liked it, right? And I think what he was trying to say was maybe once he played maybe once years ago. There's potentially a chance I taught him. Um, Guggen was very active in the University of Windsor gaming scene and had started up a gaming club there that I worked with him on, and uh, we were starting to play games at there was like a pizza pizza style place. And we were playing games there a couple times, and eventually we moved into the Green Bean by the university. So I kind of got Guggen into hobby gaming, and he managed to get a bunch of university students out, which are people we still see out to this day, which is pretty awesome. But back then, I'm sure we played Catan, right? And back then, I had a billboard that we used to post on the back wall that had a picture of Catan, because that was the recognizable it's a hobby game, along with chess pieces. Because again, that was recognizable as, oh, that means games. You know, pawns mean games. And I had a pair of 2D6 dice, right? Um, but even back then, be like, oh, you want to play Catan? And be like, nah, I don't want to play. So off the top of my head, like th this is pure theory. For one, there are a bunch of us that played a lot of Catan. Um, I bought Catan. I have I, any longtime fans of the podcast have heard this story before. Out of gaming, went to uh, where Deanna and I are about to go to London. We're sitting at Ferrari's having an amazing, uh, uh, what do you call them? Omelet, sausage and bacon omelet. We're so good there. And I've just run across the street randomly to a little convenience store and buy an issue of Games Magazine. And we decide we're going to London that day. And whenever, whenever we went on a train trip, I buy Games Magazine. That's what we do on the trip. And then I look it up. And in this episode, it has the Games 100, the top 100 games of all time. And I say to Deanna, I, this is without even flipping it open, we're going to buy the number one game. Whatever it is, we're going to buy it. And that game was Catan. And when we get back to Windsor, we tried to, looked online for hobby shops. We found out there was a hobby shop called Hugen and Munin, which we'd never been to, that was actually close to Deanna's end of town. We drove over there and we're like, oh my God, it's the guy from the sci-fi shop, Ian, who used to run a, a geeky sci-fi gaming store downtown. 
with uh, I think he was an employee, not an owner. Maybe he was the owner. I don't know. There was a couple of people I met through then. And then they're like, hey, do you have this Catan game? And sure enough, he has Catan. And we started playing Catan and we love Catan and we played Catan and we played and we played and we played. Uh, this happened to be a period of time when my parents used to go to Texas and we would host it. And to host it, we would go to their house on the weekend and we would bring Catan and we would invite people over like snail runs and uh, Sean now in Edmonton, not Sean from Hamilton, Sean formerly from Hamilton or Sean Hamilton, a different Sean that I used to collect who now lives uh, far away. Uh, would play and there was usually beer involved uh, of course back then it was pretty crappy beer maybe maybe walkerville was like a good night but there was beer involved and we played a lot of Catan. um to the fact that we played so much Catan, we're like Catan's awesome we need more and i would go back to uh hugan and Munich, and I'm like okay you got more Catan. okay here's Sir seafarers and then we play the heck out of that and i'm like all right you got more Catan. oh cities and nights oh ian there's a problem though like this is so popular we're getting more people can i get another copy so we'd have two copies of Catan. And second, what, what, five or six player expansion? We can play with more people? Oh, give me those two. So didn't take long. It was basically over a period of one or I think it might have been two summers. Might have been two summers. that We all got hooked on Catan and got a bunch of people hooked on Catan. And that would be my reintroduction to hobby board games. Like from there, I then went, well, what's game number two? Oh, Power Grid. I should pick that up. What's game number three? And eventually I'm like, someone's like, oh, have you checked Board Game Geek? What? Board Game Geek? This is 2003. Board Game Geek's brand new. I went on Board Game Geek. Number one, Tigris and Euphrates. Well, I'll have to pick that up too, and so on. But fast forward five, seven, eight, ten. Now it's 20 years later, literally. Wow. 20 years later, I don't feel like playing Catan at all. I, I have played Catan. I, I used to bring Catan to public play events because it's so good at hooking new people. It's showing people that board games can be more than Monopoly and you don't just roll dice to move. They can do other things. And it teaches trading and all these great things. But I have no interest in even playing it now. Like, none. I, I bought the Traders and Barbarians expansion because I didn't have it. I've never opened it. It's downstairs because I just have no interest. One, so one of my things with Catan is I didn't overplay it. I wasn't yeah. in the wave of gamers who got introduced to hobby gaming through Catan. And so I didn't get this massive waves, which means when I sit down with a, with a bunch of people who have played Catan, it's a lot less fun for me because yeah. they've already played through all of it and they know all the ins and outs of Catan. And I don't, I haven't played the death, played the death of it. So it's just not as much fun for me because I am not, you know, there's a, a massive skill imbalance simply mm -hmm. from the sheer volume of play. Uh, and yeah. so I would probably enjoy Catan if I played with a bunch of people who've barely ever played Catan before. Uh, but trying to find a bunch of people who have barely ever played Catan before is actually quite difficult. Yeah. Uh, and so in that, for that purpose, for that reason, I've kind of always just tuned out Catan and it's like, yeah, that's that game. Okay, fine. I mm -hmm. great game. I'm it, you know, it's got a fantastic place in board game history. It's currently 488th overall. See, on, that's pretty good on for board a, game a, a more than 20 year old game at this point. And uh, you know, it's just that's great. I have respect it for its history. I have played it, but I don't ever really need to again. Yep. Uh, another one I see, not as much anymore, but uh, that, I don't know what you call it, board game hipsterism. <laughs> there, the, some people think they're too good for Catan, um, it, it, which honestly, that's the same attitude of making fun of people who play Monopoly, which no one should do. If people are enjoying a game, let them enjoy it. Um, so there becomes this, yeah, I did that. I'm better than Catan. I now play heavier games. Um, listen to our entire episode on the board game life cycle. And realize that like everyone kind of goes through that phase in some way. Some are more smug about it than others where you're just like, oh, I've moved past that game. I'm on to, I like heavy games. I like, I, I like more in Oh, my games have to be three hours long or six hours long. And they kind of, you get this, this clickism of it. that actually kind of sucks. It's not a good part of the industry. Um, and I find a lot of people seem to have that about Catan in particular. Like Catan is up there with Monopoly on games I snub because I'm beyond them. Right. Or as, or as Snail Run says, I thought I liked Catan, but I liked the alcohol that went along with playing Catan. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh -huh. Totally fair. Yeah. 
the one thing, uh, the one thing about Monopoly is you don't hate don't hate hate on people who like Monopoly, but if they're playing Monopoly and actively hating it, then yeah. yes, you can hate on them yes. because they, yeah, yeah. they don't they they clearly just don't know that there is more out there and they're yes. just playing it because they don't know any better. Yep. Then there is a reason to sort of introduce them to more things and try and push yep. them out of it. But if they're enjoying themselves, I'm not sure how, but more power to them. Yes. I, like I said, my, my daughter started up a board game club. We haven't talked about that in weeks because, well, we haven't been here. Um, but the most played game at it is Monopoly, and it's in a half hour lunch break. So, like, they, they enjoy starting Monopoly. They, they enjoy rolling the dice, moving, and maybe owning some property. Like, 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 I don't know. I don't. Obviously, they enjoy the company of playing a game with someone. Right. You know, I, buying, I think, buying, having money, I, the, the like, capitalist like, dream before it gets to the capitalist cutthroat, reality yeah. uh, later in the game. Yeah, I don't know. Like, like she can't can get people to play hobby games, right? Like, she's trying. And we keep having, and this is something I don't know if you've noticed in my game recommendation list. I've shifted to recommending easier, simpler games overall. I'll still recommend the big ones, but I'll call them out as the big ones because I have learned that that I have a narrow perspective as a hobby gamer of what people are willing to play. Um, and it's something else Eric Lang has been calling out recently that you don't realize how little the average person wants to learn to do something. They just want to sit down and do the thing. And so games where you can literally go roll the dice and I'll show you what happens are better than anything you have to read a rule book for first. Yep. Right. So the, and I now know this as a thing. Now, I'm we're obviously most of the people listening to us are hobby gamers and we're going to keep recommending hobby games. But I'm now more cognizant of that. So when I'm doing recommendations, I'm a lot more careful. And if you look at the games I bring to the barbershop bar compared to the games that I'm going to bring out when Sean, Tori and Kat are coming over, they're in two different classes of games. And no, one is not better than the other. Yeah. No, it was really interesting, actually, this last uh, time at uh, the barbershop bar, uh, there was a young a uh, couple with four kids with them and nice. they were playing uh they when we first got there they were playing apples to apples and they were having a grand old time uh and eventually they kept coming over the the one of the one or two of the boys kept coming over and checking out the table full of games and trying to mm. see what they wanted to play uh and at one point they grabbed smash up disney because the the other team Ooh. the other table had finished and i said yeah you know look this is this one may be a little hard for you guys uh if 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 everyone's interested we can we can start looking at it, but I, I recommend maybe trying something a little else, a little different. And then I pulled up drop it and I said, would you guys yeah. like to try this? And I'll give this a try. They ended up playing uh, four or five games in a <laughs> row of it. Yeah. Um, but drop they, it. There's nothing to teach, right? Like pick exactly. up a piece and drop it in. Right. Yep. And and then here's how you score. Here's when you don't get points. And that's yep. it. And they had, they had a fantastic time. Uh, and unfortunately that's when I discovered that Ian doesn't have copies of it at the store. Yeah, that's but, uh, that's like every event. I think we're going to go through that one. Maybe they can get them in now. Yep. All right. Moving back to Catan. So another reason. Catan's old. Games have progressed, changed, gotten more interesting, more engaging Um, to go with what we were just talking about. You can't sit someone down and just play Catan. The first decision in Catan is where to place your first settlement. And if you've never played before, you don't know what you're doing. You need to know the game to make that choice. Now, yes, I do strongly recommend new players use the preset setup. No one does this, but they should, because it removes that decision at the beginning. And then you can get into, you know what? You are playing these two settlements already set up. Roll the dice. I'll tell you what happens. You want to get to that point as quick as possible. But Catan has things in it like player elimination. No, you can't be eliminated from the game, but you can get cut off so that you can never build anything ever again which is the equivalent of player elimination. Mm -hmm. It has hidden information that people can spring on you to win, which is great when you're a competitive tournament player and you know there are four victory point cards in, like Sean said, the, the, the players who know the game versus the ones that don't. I know there are four victory point game cards in that development deck, and I know you can hold on to them until the end of the game and go, I'm only at seven, but I have three of these. And if you use cards to look at other players' hands and you know how many you have and you know the odds, you can play to that. Well, the average player is not going to enjoy that take that moment, that, oh, the race to 10, but I have 10 at 7. It's not fun for everyone else at the table. It's fun for the person who does it. Again, unless you're playing with a bunch of experienced Catan players, like, oh, you managed to pull it off. Good job. Um, the um, There's no actual exploration or discovery in the game. 
like despite the fact on what it's kind of trying to sell you it's not what it is it, it it's a, it's a trading game it is a race and a trading game and people don't necessarily realize that when they're told oh it's all about settling this land i'm like no no it's a race you're trying to make the longest road you're trying to build the largest army you're trying to get to 10 points and it's all about trading with other players plus it, it can be broken depending on your group if you get social in the game where someone doesn't like someone at the table and goes, I'm not trading with them, that can ruin the whole game experience. Yeah, it, it's interesting. It's, it's interesting to note that, again, they've changed the name of the game from Settlers of Catan to yes. Catan Trade Build Settle. Uh, well, they- <laughs> that is also also a, a trying to improve the... Um, accessibility is not the right word and see this is what happens when it's been four weeks they're removing the colonialism from it you are now part of Catan and trading building you're not settling right. it's removing an aspect which actually i think was a really good call yep no, it's, it's more progressive there Catan has gotten more progressive in a very subtle way that i think is brilliant because i gotta admit even the old version i never felt it was colonial it, 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 it to me was a deserted island when you were settling it you weren't exploiting anyone, but I can see how some people saw it that yep. way. And the fact of the matter is the game is really more about the trade and build yes. than the settle. And, and yes. the new renaming sort of has reemphasized that and refocused on what the game was already about, uh, yes. but made it more clear in its branding. Very true. Yeah. <laughs> so Ryan is saying half the players shortened it to calling it Settlers, the other's just Catan. Yeah, I was one of the people with Settlers. Yep. Do you want to play Settlers? Can you come over and play Settlers? We're gonna yep. play some ca- Settlers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and they're saying like uh, Ryan saying always starts with the preset board at the rule book center with new players. And I agree you should. But honestly, it just feels dated. Like like I think there's there's better games where you roll dice to generate resources. We've talked about all of three of the big ones nowadays. And there it's... are better games for trading stuff. There are better games for building routes and connecting routes. Like it just, it, it, it stands up to the test of time. And the fact that I don't think it's a bad game in any way, but it is 28 years old. There you go. 28. (laughs) It's even older than I thought. Yeah. So Uh, there's another reason people don't play it. Now with that new hotness, there are many board game Epicureans out there. I am one of them that are more interested in playing something new and hot and interesting than playing something old, no matter how good it might be. My kids are like this, and I don't know, like, I don't think that was the way I raised them, but, like, trying to get my kids to do old, play old things, like, from the Switch, like, you have access to, like, 80 games from the NES. No, no interest whatsoever. Well, yeah, oh, now we have Super Nintendo game. No, these these are old games, Dad. We don't play old games. <laughs> but meanwhile, they'll play I Am Bread for six hours straight, but I can't get them to play, like, Metroid, you know? But whatever, that's that's their thing, right? They're they're all about modern, flashy, whatever, right? Like different style. And even with board games, they're like, oh, that looks like an old game, Dad. Is that an old one? And and they're no interest. Like they have no interest in learning. Like I get it, they're kids. No interest in learning Power Grid doesn't seem that strange. But like the way Gwen plays, I think she'd love Power Grid. With with her or the planning out every decision and planning ahead and watching her play Ticket to Ride, you're like, oh, she'd like building routes and power grid, <laughs> but like no interest at all. They're like, no. But what about that game you got that showed up the other day? That they're all interested in, right? So I don't know any any other reasons you can think of why why people why gamer groups don't play Catan. I think we've covered sort of all the major spots yeah. between between the game being tired, people being tired of it, of it, hipsterism. Uh, and the lack of someone like me who wanting to get involved yeah, into into some into a game with people who are already deep into it or already were deep into it. Yeah, actually, I find that one fascinating. I hadn't even considered that. But yeah, like like it's hard to beat Deanna in many games, but Catan she's particularly good at, and you have to know how to stop her or she'll win. Right. I know how to stop her. Other players we play with know how to stop her. She has a certain strategy that works most of the time. If you can prevent that strategy, at least she has to branch out and you've got a chance. Right. But if you don't know, you're in trouble. Yeah. Now, where I do think Catan still stands up is that it's still a good, and I like this. I mean, I think I'm going to try to do this. So the Dice Tower has stopped using the term gateway game. They, uh, because it, it, it kind of reeks of gatekeeping. Mm. And what they now use is welcoming game. 
And I kind of dig that. So I'm going to try to use that. I don't know if I'll be able to shift my entire vocabulary over. So I'm going to try to do that. But I still think Catan is a good welcoming game for people in particular like Monopoly. Like the 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 two dice. Because it does a really good job of showing off subtle changes from what games used to be to what games are now. That that you, you have your hand of cards is like having a hand of money. Or more so, a hand of properties. The fact you can trade your resources is just like trading properties. So they've anyone who's playing Monopoly properly has that trading down. They're used to rolling two dice to move. Now you're rolling two dice to do something else. That's an eye opener. Like I'm amazed by how much that blows people away. A good example of this, Jeff Seuss might remember this. We're at the Windsor Comic Con and we're showing off the Funkoverse games. And a couple sits down and they, it happened to be um, Jean Grey as, as uh, the Phoenix. And uh, I think it was Beast sat down to play this game and the first thing they did i said it's your turn they grabbed the dice and rolled them and and i said what are you doing they're like well i'm rolling to to see how far i can move i'm like no 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 okay. and like just that right there kind of opened my eyes i'm like oh wow most people think the start of any game like well think clue monopoly uh sorry trouble all starts with roll the dice to figure out how far you can move yeah i'm like no 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 not that that dice is to use to figure out combat Here's how you move. Your character has a movement rate, you know, and they were just like. Yeah. Ice can be used for more than figuring out how far you can move. Yeah. All right. So that's well, a good one. Jeff Seuss is saying an opener game. Yep. A game you introduce to a friend to open the world of games to them. I like that one too. Openers. Sub yeah, and sits down. True. Openers works. I, I like both. Welcoming game sounds pretty good. Yep. Welcoming game sounds more family friendly to me. Like, like that's the game where you're like kids, families, come play. I, and I and I can go, I can go blue if you want to start talking openings. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, we'll skip that. But <laughs> I think wel welcoming definitely has more overall family friendly uh, connotations to it. Yes, uh, and is harder to take down into uh, the sewers of my mind. There you go. All right, <laughs> so let's finish this off by boldly going to this question from Christian. Christopher Lundgren, what is your favorite, if you have one, Star Trek board game or miniatures game? All right. Star Trek's interesting. Uh, of all the licenses out there, I think Star Trek has the biggest mixed bag of games created using that license. Like, there are some absolutely terrible games. With the Star Trek license, and I'm not talking 1970 roll and move and move your standee for Kirk around the Enterprise. I'm not even talking modern Star Trek games and some really fantastic games. And honestly, I was thinking about this. Like I, I started writing this out, right? And I, and I got Christopher's question. I, I, I thought of my immediate answer and I thought of two others. I kind of like, I like runner ups, right? And then I'm like, oh, but I've also got this. And then there's that. And then I started thinking about all the bad ones I don't own, but I played. And we might eventually turn this into the best Trek games I've played. What I'll need to do beforehand is I'm going to try to get Sean to play a few of them so that we can both talk it, talk about it. So so here are my favorites, though. We're not doing that full thing tonight. Um, the, I, will, I will throw out one bad one not to pick up. Um, no, I can't remember the name of it. It's, it's, it's Star Trek Bridge Cruise, and it has... Both the new generation, and the old, but it's just Yahtzee. You're rolling dice <laughs> to try to match patterns. Now I got to look it up if that's the right name. Crew. No, that's the video game, Bridge Crew. Anyone played that? Because I thought about picking it up. Star Trek Bridge Crew. Uh, no, this is video games. No, I can't remember it now. Oh, well, not important. So I won't do a bad one. We'll just talk about good ones. <laughs> games you open a bottle of beer to play. That there's a, there's an episode. <laughs> we don't want to advocate drinking too much. I, I probably do that more than I should as it is. Uh, so anyway, number one, the, the first one that, that I want to mention, because this is actually really solid, is Star Trek Expeditions from WizKids Games. Uh, this is a cooperative board game based on, um, what do they call it? The Kelvin Trek, I think is what people are calling it nowadays. But the new relaunch of Star Trek reboot, uh, with Chris reboot. Pine. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the reboot. Um, which sadly seems to be dead. I actually really enjoyed the reboot. Um, so this one is a Star Trek episode in a box. You have one planet, you have the Enterprise in orbit, you have a Klingon battle cruiser coming into the planet, and you are sending out away teams to deal with situations on the planet. 
Now, there are multiple different scenarios you can play through, and it's actually a branching path as you play through all of them. So like after you've done one thing, if you ended up solving the first problem on the planet, you move on to this next part. And then if you don't solve that, like it branches, whether you win or lose each section, it's really well done. Um, you have little clicks like figures and the clicks, all it is is when they take damage, you click them. So unfortunately, WizKids is famous for this. You can't use them with hero clicks. I don't know why they don't stick to the same thing. Um, but same thing with the enterprise, the, the clicks is actually how, how you distribute your energy. So you can move it like between shields and engines and you just turn the click to whatever three settings you want for whatever. I think it's shields, weapons, and engines. Again, good use of clicks, but don't buy this thinking you're going to get to play hero clicks. Um, only comes with four characters, but there is a mini expansion with three more. So you end up with actually a, a total of, uh, seven different crew members you can use. You're going to use four per game. And it's really neat because you can mix and match, right? Like you got Kirk and Uhura, Sulu's one of the uh, expansion ones. You've got Spock and I think Scotty is in the main game. I can't remember who else is in the, the expansion. But this really feels like playing through one episode of Star Trek, but with the new crew, because there are no episodes with the new crew. But it feels like you're playing through a Star Trek episode, and it's really neat. Uh, and... Uh... Uh, Red Meeple Ryan is saying Five Year Mission is the nice game. Is that is that it? Five Year Mission. It's the one where where it combines both bridge crews from Next Generation and the original. I'm gonna look quick and see if that is the one. That's probably the one. And I'm just looking at who comes with the expansion here. Yeah, which uh, come with which? So it can, you get Scotty, Sulu, and Chekhov. Okay. So yeah, Star Trek Five Year Mission. That is the one. And it's like, take control of the Enterprise, roll dice, and survive the perils of your mission. But it's just, it's roll for it yeah, type right. of thing. <laughs> like, you're rolling dice, and you're putting them on top of cards with pictures of the crew. And, like, the whole thing where it shows the Enterprise crew looking at the Enterprise crew on the box, that doesn't really come into play. It's just you have cards from both genres. It just, I, I honestly was, was, is it Nizia? No, I'm surprised. It just felt like a math game. And, no, and it, it Nizia is Expeditions. Oh, there you go. Well, Expeditions <laughs> is good. Um, it just, it, it felt like I was doing something mechanical with a Star Trek theme. It is, it is one of the, the worst I played. Yeah. Um, sorry for fans. If you dig it, great. I uh, did not enjoy Expeditions that is not rated all that well, though. Uh, it's only a 6.5. Uh, the problem is, it's one episode on one planet. Right. Once you've done it once, you've kind of seen it. Mm -hmm. And you can replay it, and the path might branch another way, but, and, and like, uh, I still own my copy. I am willing to play it again, but it was not one I wanted to play even like a week later. Like I played it and I'm like, I don't want to play that. We just played this, but give it a month. I totally would play again because you, you change the locations and you change where these tokens are and it does get mixed up, but you're playing one episode over and over and right. you're going to know the ending there, even though I think there's like eight different endings. So you could try for all of them. Uh, next up is Star Trek Attack Wing. This was, I don't know if it was the first or second. I don't know what came first, the Dungeons and Dragons Attack Wing or this, but one of the first games to license the X-Wing uh, Series 1, like the original X-Wing system, and put out a new game for it. Now, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I got to play it because of a local gamer. Uh, I'm not even going to try to name them because I, it's not popping in my head right away. Awesome local gamer brought it out to an event we had at Brimstone Games, and I played it, and I'm like, wow, this is good, like really good. Uh, the problem was I then tried to buy copies and it was out of print at the time. Now they have released a brand new edition of this and a new set was released yesterday. So despite the fact WizKids doesn't really talk about this game, it is still supported. Despite the fact you haven't seen anything new in a couple of years, that's COVID, not WizKids. They're now coming out with the latest set, which is a new Klingon set. It looks really cool. Um, I have not played this new edition, so I can't talk to it. I don't know if it's based on X-Wing Second Edition or they relaunched the whole game or if they changed anything. But what I really liked about this, which makes perfect flipping sense when you realize it's Star Trek, is it's all about the crews and less about the ships. Whereas X-Wing is all about the ships and technically the pilot, but they're one and the same in X-Wing. Like if you when you when you buy an X-Wing, you choose is it is it Wedge's X-Wing, is it Luke's X-Wing, is it Hobby's X-Wing? You do that. Whereas this one, you pick the Enterprise or a Cavort class cruiser, and then your cards, instead of being a bunch of upgrade cards, were all different crew. And that was just really that felt like Star Trek. And then of course there were rules for boarding parties and beaming onto other ships and beaming your characters to some of your own ships. And that made it feel very different from X-Wing. 
Plus, they went epic with the original release of this game where you could buy a two scale DS9. And many of the missions were campaign based. Instead of just blow the other people out of space, there was something to do. Because again, it's Star Trek, not X Wing. You weren't just trying to shoot the other people out of space, you were trying to accomplish a mission. I really dig that game. Um, if I played two player miniature battle games, uh, for one, I'd probably be playing X Wing Second Edition, but I would be looking to pick this up. It's just not something I do in my current gaming life. We are not, if Sean starts coming over more often, maybe we'll start doing two player stuff. But Deanna and I, if we're going to play a two player game, it's not Star Trek Attack Wing. It's interesting. I mean, you know, for a game that came out in 2013 to have expansions coming out in 2021, 2022, 2023. Well, that's the new edition. Like I said, there, it's, there's a new edition out there, even See, though it's, it's only got one listing. Yeah, that's weird that there's, they're not, like, there's no edition, there's no version listing for a new version. Yeah, so maybe it's that similar. Like, maybe yeah. it didn't change enough to need a new... It's one of the things that, again, if I was... Sean's not a big Trek fan either. He'd probably rather play X-Wing with me, even though I know he's not even a huge Star Trek fan either. But I think he likes Star Trek more than Trek. Oh, it's hard to say. I, it, that's a, yeah. It's a tough call between the pair of them. Um, I, I probably do lean more towards Trek because it does, while it's not hard science, it's closer to hard science than it's Space trying. Wizards. Yes, <laughs> it's trying. Well, it, it, it's sci-fi versus sci-fantasy, I think, is, yeah. is the, the, the main thing. Yeah. So now my top Star Trek game, and honestly, if you Google this question, this is going to be everyone's top Trek game, as far as I can tell. Everyone loves this game. That is Star Trek Ascendancy. This is Star Trek in a box. Not an episode, Star Trek, all of it, the entire thing from forging new warplanes to discovering new worlds to seeking out new civilizations uh, to literally the map can change as you're playing because you're like, oh, the next planet is three parsecs away. And you literally put the parsec out and you, you can move it to connect the planet because it's 3D space. And it kind of represents 3D space in, in, in two dimensions. And I think at this point, I, I don't know. There's got to be at least nine factions out for this game. Um, interestingly, it is one of the few three-player only games when it launched. It was you had to play three players. You had the Federation, the Romulans, and the Klingons. And that was it. But as the game evolved, you can now, I think you can actually play with all the factions on a massive game. This is a game I actually went out and bought the battle mat for. Because you're supposed to play on a three-by-three three plant like grid because the planets will get too close to each other and you'll, we won't be able to fit them all. Though I know people who play on stuff like my 8x4 board game table and don't worry about that and just let the, let the whole solar system sprawl. You are doing Trek things. You're, you're landing on planets. You're going through encounters. You're sending away teams. You're building fleets. You're having ship combat. You're doing the things you do in Star Trek. If you are the Klingons, you get points for wiping people out and taking over colonies. If you're the Federation, you get points for converting people to your cause. Uh, you are space missionaries, because that's pretty much what Star <laughs> Trek actually is. And you are going to the Klingon planets and converting them to Federation. And while the Romulans are just the Romulans, and they kind of get points for doing both things. They want to blow some things up, but they also want to subvert other players' colonies. And it's fascinating. Now, I will admit, for how much I like this game, it's epic. It's long. It's 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 not Twilight Imperium, but it is not a quick game. And I don't get it to the table often enough. And because of that, I only own the original three factions. Right. This I mean, is one that if I knew more Trek keys, I would probably buy more and play it more often. I mean, because this is a three player, three hour, yeah. three point one six weight. I, that's game. three hours when you know what you're doing. Exactly. Right. right. But if you do enjoy it, you can play Ferengi, Cardassian, Borg, Vulcan, Andorian, Dominion, and Breen. Um, oh, so we're at seven? Was that seven so factions? There, there are seven additional factions on top additional. of the Romulan, so Klingon, and, Fe and Federation. Wow, so ten. Ten. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And there's some cool stuff. Like, if you buy the Borg expansion, it was the first expansion that came out. The Borg start in the center of the galaxy and spread out, okay? The thing is, there's two ways to play the Borg. You can now play a four-player game. Someone plays the board. Or they can be an AI faction that's against everyone. And I thought that was fascinating. Like, that is just a brilliant way to represent the board in a Star Trek game. And that's kind of what everything in this is like. It's just like they managed to nail the factions. They managed to nail the differences. They managed to catch all the little aspects of Star Trek all at once. Yeah, I know. This, this is the one of the three that really interests me. Uh, you look at the design, the design team behind it, oh, yeah. Aaron Dill, John Kowalewski, and Sean Swigert. 
Um, you know, there's some great names behind it, and they've clearly put a lot of weight into it. Both yeah. the base game and all of the expansions, other than uh, I think one of them is yeah, the the Breen Confederacy isn't 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 showing very well, but it's oh, also that was the, the newest. newest. It's the newest one, so it could be. I mean, one, I don't even know who the Breen are. Uh, Deep Space Nine. They're uh, from yeah, Deep Space the, Nine. Yeah, Breen are one of those. Uh, I never really did Deep Space Nine. Well, but, the pro- okay, my, my theory on this, and I'm probably going to get some hate mail, Moa at TabletopBellhop.com, <laughs> is they made the Klingons weak in Deep Space Nine because they were working with the Federation, so they needed a new badass. And right. the Breen were the, the badass. You never saw their faces, and no one could defeat their ships. Fair. So, like, to me, that's why they were at it. I don't know if that's the reason, but it felt like it. It kind of felt like they, you know, weakened the Klingons. So, uh, Uh, so so Darkling Blight. Ascendancy Ascendancy says the one that, to me, sounds like the one I'm most interested in in giving a try. Now, before Ascendancy, there was Star Trek Fleet Captains, which I used to call Star Trek in a box. But Ascendancy just did it so much better. I have no interest to play Fleet Captains. Fleet Captains, again, was Wiz Kids with clicks. You control the fleet of three ships. And you explored, you went to spots on the board, you flipped the planet over and did what was there. And sometimes it was a combat encounter. Sometimes it was, it was exploration. You need the right crew there and you could fight the other player, which was awesome. Like when that came out, we're like, oh my God, nothing feels like Trek as much as this, but ascendancy just like, I'm sorry, fleet captains. (laughs) I'm not quite sure why I still own you because (laughs) I have ascendancy. So darkling blight in the chat said took seven hours at a con using the Dominion War expansion with six players and noted the Borg was in play, but never actually showed up. So there you go. If the Borg's like a thing that may or may not happen, that's even cool. Like you might run into the Borg. Interestingly, Fleet Captains is rated uh, almost exactly the same as Ascendancy. Ascendancy. Uh, So the fans still like it. Uh, And said, honestly, I should sit down and play both again. Fleet Captains is a tiny bit lighter. Uh, and yes. again, that still leads me to believe that Ascendancy is probably the game for me. Yeah. Not that I'm a heavy gamer, but a, out of two games that are similar. If you're playing Trek, you, you kind of want a bit of heaviness or you want super light. Right. I, I'm going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel that I feel like the the slightly heavier is, is just going to draw me in a little bit more, a little bit more meat to it um, yeah. rather than, you know, unless I'm playing unless I want to play something that's family and then three is mm-hmm. too high anyway. So it doesn't matter. yes. <laughs> Now, the one thing that didn't happen with Fleet Captains is you don't have the expansions, right? Like, you're 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 done at that point. Uh, so Jeff Seuss calls out the story game Kingdom would be an awesome Star Trek role-playing session, which does lead me to an honorable mention, the Star Trek role-playing game by FASA. I, I picked that up on eBay at a decent price. Like, I didn't overpay for it, but I didn't get it cheap. Um, back then I was running single session Saturdays or Sundays. I don't remember what day of the week it was trying to play through games that were iconic that I never played that like I had copies of and stuff and replaying old favorites. So, like we played Marvel superheroes and I read and breeder bombs for anyone who remembers that. And Sean actually drove down from Hamilton to play this. Um, and if I remember you even came with an app with like sounds from Star Trek to use while we were playing. And we played through first edition fast as Star Trek, and it was fantastic. Um, and it wasn't like the players mattered. The players enjoyed it. It was the fact that everyone knows Trek and knows techno babble and knows how Trek's supposed to progress. And it, it, it just it clicked and everyone was on point and everyone just played Trek and it was awesome. Now, what I couldn't tell you is if it was despite the game or if the game was actually that good, too. But I will say it didn't feel like we were fighting with it at all. Yeah, which is an important fact. Yes. Now, Ride Meeple Ryan in the chat is calling out Star Trek Adventures, which is the latest Star Trek role playing game that, man, I'm curious. But as everyone knows, since we started this show, me getting role playing games to the table has gotten difficult. And I already have a pile that I feel obliged to play. So, yep. yeah. Yeah. Trek- so, Jeff Seuss. Yep. Star Trek, yeah, Star Trek from FASA has a reputation for being one of the few RPGs of that era tied to an IP that actually fit the IP instead of just being D&D in the Star Trek universe. Yeah, it very much was not D&D. You, uh, it, it, it predates Traveler, or no, it's after Traveler. But like Traveler, you actually go through Starfleet Academy and make dice rolls to see where you end up when you get out and have skills based on how you did. And it was D100 based. And then the combat system... 
and the exploration system was basically XCOM before XCOM existed. To the fact that I wonder if the people who designed XCOM played this because it was an action point system. You got so many points a turn based on some of your stats and you use them like literally in a spend one to move forward, spend half to turn, you know, uh, spend six points to fire a phaser kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't Traveler with a facelift either. No, I agree, Jeff. I, I, maybe someday I'll run it for you. Now, I enjoyed that game so much, I had heard from fans that the second edition is even better, so went out and bought a copy. That I did overpay for. Well, not really. I paid going market price for in 20-whatever for a, a game that that's old. Um, and I've heard it's even better, but I never actually ran that one. That was that was on my list to do, and we never did. Right. So you have have you played any Trek games at all? Uh, just that FASA. <laughs> just the just FASA, the FASA RPG, RPG. Yeah. yeah. Which was a ton of fun. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think we need to sit you down. Um, I know you just like I know you're not a huge Trek fan, but like most Trek games are just good sci-fi games. Yeah, yeah. Like absolutely. Ascendancy is a three fi- three faction four X game. Yeah, I think I think definitely the Star Trek as opposed to the Star Wars are going yeah. to be more attractive to me as games in just in general. So though I still think you'd love Imperial Assault with its dungeon crawl feel. Because that's a totally different look at sci-fi. Right. All right. Well, uh, that's it for our answers of a few, uh, a few quest- short questions that we've been holding on to for far too long yes. and our update on where we've been. No, we didn't pod fade. Yes, we are back and ready to celebrate episode 200 next week. Now, remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Clicking on Ask the Bellhop at tabletopbellhop.com. Send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Or hitting me up on social media at Tabletop, no, no, sorry, uh, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to our review of Dolce, a deliciously fun game. This is from Stronghold Games, who we have to thank for providing us with a review copy. So Dolce is a confectionery-based board game designed by Julio E. Nazario, featuring artwork by Justine Norte. It was published in September just last year, 2022, by Stronghold Games. This dessert-themed game plays one to four players, with games taking less than an hour, getting quicker the more experience players have. The game is listed for ages 14 plus with an MSRP of $39.99 US dollars. So in Dolce, players are building a confectionery empire by planting fields, building cafes, harvesting ingredients, and scoring points for completed confections. Every player has their own deck of cards, but will be dealing with the same input each round. Used ingredients can produce byproducts, which can be passed to another cafe or used to feed your chicken. The player who manages to build the best ingredient engine will score the most points and win the game. For a look at the components you get in this engine builder, check out our Dolce unboxing video on YouTube. Now, you will find surprisingly thick player boards for a Stronghold game. I wanted to call this out because Stronghold is known for thin player boards in the past. Maybe they have finally got past that point. An eight page rulebook, a 24 card deck of cards for each of the four players, a wooden scoring meeple and chicken token for each player and plastic ingredient cubes in five colors. There's also a set of four reference cards that I recommend you leave in the box until after you've actually taught the game. While these are great to reference once you know how to play, we found they actually hindered learning the game if read in advance. Yeah. Now, the component quality here is good. Um, I appreciate the thickness of the boards. That's awesome to see. I love the little wooden chicken token, and I dig the plastic ingredient cubes. Like, I got to admit, the old school gamer in me was like, where's the wooden cubes? But these plastic ones are actually really nice. Um, Where the game does lose some points, though, are graphic design choices. these include things like the grid on the player board is a little light, hard to see. The art on the fat on the um, cafe cards is repeated on every card with only minor ch- changes. And the iconography for ingredient levels could have been much clearer. Also, this box has a lot of air. I realize this doesn't impact gameplay at all, but the actual game components here take up less than one third of the box. We'll get into more detail about that when sharing our thoughts on the game later. But for that, Though, let's give an overview of play. So at the start of a game at Dolce, everyone takes a player board, scoring meeple and chicken, 
in the color they want to play. The scoring marker and chicken are placed on the zero spot on the outside edge of the board. Um, specifically, we like to put the chickens off the board, just kind of on the outside with the meeple on the actual scoring track. Now, one player shuffles their deck and removes four cards from the bottom. Each round, the top card will be drawn from this deck and everyone else will find the matching card in their own decks. Then everyone simultaneously has to decide what to do with that card. Now, this card can be converted into a cafe. You play it face up beside your player board. Cafes turn ingredients into points. Each cafe requires two different ingredients, the level of which depends on the specific cafe card. Now, before we go on, we need to talk a bit about ingredients, <laughs> as they are the most complicated part of this game. There are four ingredients, peanuts, cacao, vanilla, and coffee. Each of these can be at three different quality levels. Your bean, ground bean, and butter. Different cafes require different ingredients at different quality levels. For example, the Fudge Cafe requires pure cacao and ground peanut to score. The cafes which are pre-printed on your player boards all require pure beans. So freshly harvested ingredients come out as pure beans. They can be placed on cafes needing pure beans or any lower level of the same ingredient. The tricky part here, though, is after a cafe scores, the ingredients used are removed from there, but they downgrade one level and can then be passed on to another cafe that could then potentially score. Trust me, this confuses everyone at first, and the small icons on the cafes showing ingredient levels don't help with this. We'll get into ingredient levels a bit more when we get to scoring. So the next option for when you've got your card is to use it to plant fields. You're going to place the card on your player board upside down and fill it with the four resources sewn on the back of the card. Now, note, if you cover up an existing field with a matching ingredient, you get to put a bonus cube. Now, the most cubes on a single spot can hold this two. And if you end up covering up an existing cube you hadn't harvested yet, that ingredient is fed to your chicken. The final action is harvest. You discard your card and choose one row or column on your player board and take all the ingredient cubes from that line. Each cube must be placed into a cafe or fed to your chicken if you don't have room. Now, after harvesting, you can also have your chicken lay eggs. Eggs cost three each and are wild ingredients that can be used to fill any one cafe ingredient spot, but don't produce byproducts. After all players have chosen and completed one of the three actions with their cards, you then move on to a scoring phase. Any player that has any full cafes must score them. They score one point for the full cafe, then remove the ingredients from that cafe. They then can move any byproducts produced to a different cafe. When removed from a cafe, each ingredient downgrades one level. Your beans turn into ground beans, and ground beans turn into butter. Butter has no byproduct so any butter used is just discarded. If you run out of places to place byproduct, you instead feed it to your chicken. Through this system, you'll be trying to set up chains where you're going to use the byproducts of one or two cafes to fuel another, and then byproducts from that cafe may fuel another and so on. With this, you can even use the same cafe more than once, kind of setting up a loop, but never an infinite loop because of the way it's designed. Now the game continues for 20 rounds, and the players with the most point wins. In the case of a tie, players produce as many eggs as they can, and then total their number of eggs with the number of ingredients left in their fields. The player with the most ingredients total wins. Now, what we just described are the two to four player rules. Dolce can also be played solo. To do this, you just use one deck of cards. You shuffle it, you remove four, and then play as normal. Uh, you literally play the same game. Decide to do with each of the 20 cards left in your deck. At the end of the game, check the back of the rulebook to see how well you did, and get a rank somewhere from Baking Beginner to Macaron Master. And now you have a pretty good idea of how to play Dolce. Let's move on to our thoughts on this baking board game. So when Stronghold Games first contacted me about reviewing Dolce, I gotta say I was intrigued. The, the initial press release had me interested. Uh, the theme here was a big draw. While there are a few dessert-making games out there, like I own King Chocolate and Just Desserts, 
it's far from a common theme. It's definitely no zombies or Lovecraft. And I also really like this, the sound of the byproduct system, at least as described in the press release. Engine builders like this can be a really great game. The intricacies of developing a chain that plays out from field to product till the ingredients are used up is definitely one that is attractive. Plus, I also have a soft spot for what people have been calling bingo style games. These are games where every player gets the same input every round and has to do something with it. I've enjoyed this in games like Tiny Towns, Number 9, and Railroad Inc. Now, what I love about this style of game is that despite everyone dealing with the exact same things, all having the same inputs, everyone ends up going their own way, which ends up with everyone having totally different result at the end of the game. Now, while I won't say I'm as in love with this game style as Mo, there is a fun factor knowing that while everyone had the same input, that resultant outputs are rarely even slightly similar. Yeah. Now, I'm pleased with all the aspects I was looking forward to, right? From, from, from expectation to playing the game, Dolce fully delivered. The theme really is great, and it's well integrated through the byproduct system. And even the chicken system feels thematic, though I gotta say, the amount of coffee we fed our chickens in our games is somewhat concerning. Not only do you get a cool, pretty unique theme, you get interesting mechanics that are well tied to that theme. It's best not to think too hard about what it is you're feeding the chickens. Just imagine happy, plump chickens. Yes. Now, the real highlight here is this whole byproduct system and the engine building that's required to make the most out of it. Well, it sounds pretty simple to do in theory. Whoever designed what cafe takes what was very good at making it much more difficult than you'd think. Uh, this is there's actually a lot of strategy and thought required to pull off a solid engine in Dolce. And that alone means this game's not going to be for everyone. Now, one potential weakness of this design is that there are only 24 cards, 20 of which will be available in any game. Now, while removing four cards prevents perfect information, I'm not sure that given enough plays, memorization won't come into play. Though, I'll say it's going to take more than five plays. Though, in this case, I think that might be more of a feature than a hindrance, because knowing what cards may be coming might actually be more interesting and hoping for, you know, the fudge to come out in the second half of the game and not at the end could actually be a strategy point. For me, I actually love this complexity. I was really impressed. I like that this game is actually quite meaty, despite what seems like simple rules. Like I would literally put this in the category that you call thinky fillers, what people like to call thinky fillers. Shorter games that are going to appeal to medium to heavy Euro fans. What this means, though, is this is not a quick, fun party style. Let's make some desserts. Let's all use the same cards. Oh, what'd you do with yours kind of game. This was actually amusing, as even after reading the rules, Mo still thought this was a super light game that might not really be to our taste. Then we played it the first time, and it was immediately clear yeah. that this was not the light fluff that we were expecting. Yeah, I totally thought that the byproduct system was going to be really simple. They were like, I'm going to be easily be able to use all my three ingredients through all three stages, setting up these fun combos. No, it's not. Uh, well, the whole byproduct system works really well, and it is fun to play with. Uh, it, it, it's, it does have some problems. So, And all of these problems have to do with the iconography that was used to represent ingredient levels. Instead of, like, I would have liked to have seen a nice big one, two, or three over the ingredients, or, or bright different colors, like uh, green, red, and yellow, right? Red means stop, which means, you know, for butter, you don't use that ingredient, or you're done with it. Yellow means you can get one more use, right? Instead of that, they have little tiny icons with little thin rings around them. Your beans have three rings, ground beans have two rings, and butter has one or none. I don't even know if you call that one ring well and that's part of the problem is that the differential between these rings is so unless you've got a two next to a three it's yeah. not always clear yeah these could have been much clearer and then two of the ingredient icons actually look similar i i've yet to play a game of dolce where someone didn't go is that a two or a three ring multiple times during the game 
Indeed, you find yourself constantly double checking if it's coffee or peanut, if you've got two cafes with two rings or one with three and one with two rings, and then double checking to make sure you planted the right beans, or if you've just made a horrible mistake and ruined your engine. Now, what confuses me even more about this is that the icons are small and kind of off to the side, uh, presumably to show off the art. Right. It's it's the, the game mechanic stuff is kind of hidden in a corner. And here's this nice big picture of a cafe, which would be great if the cafes were interesting. Every single cafe in this game is identical, except for minor color differences and the words on the signs that are so small, you probably need a magnifying glass to read them anyway. I might have understood if they were showing off 24 totally unique looking cafes, each done by a different board game artist. But that's not what's happening here. There is no play benefit to any of the art involved in the cards except for the ingredients required, and yet those ingredients are not the featured element or even especially well-defined to be used with a mere glance. You need yeah. to pick up that card and look at it to say, oh, okay, no, that is Cacao 2 and Peanut 3 or so whatever. Yeah. And to add to that, it's not even like the three ingredients are always listed below or above the two ingredients. Though we did notice there is a set order to their end, but it's based on the ingredient type, which doesn't really matter as much. Right. But it would have been better that whatever the most one always, whatever costs the most should be on the top. And whatever costs the least should be at the bottom, in my opinion. Or some, anyway, something more standardized than something, what they've anything. used. Um, so another issue we found is how the player aids are written. Usually when teaching a board game, I will hand out whatever provided player aids they are while I'm teaching so the players can kind of follow along as I describe things. I almost talking about step one here. Here's the summary. Yep, that's what he said. You don't want to do this with Dolce. Uh, it's not that they're terrible. The information on them is useful, but you kind of have to know the game and have learned to play to be able to use these because of how they're written. This was a shocker as reference cards are just something I use to jumpstart my knowledge while the game is being set up or the teacher is skimming the rules as a refresher. Uh, it's a way that I can front load some information to make the teacher's job easier. And yet doing that for both myself and Deanna led to enough confusion that our first game ended up quite confused as we had gotten yeah. some incorrect ideas from the cards that hadn't been you know wiped out and, and erased by the teach yeah, yeah I, I clearly remember that first game going but where are you getting that from you're like but i thought it did this i'm like that's not what i said where why why are you getting this from because it this says it right here on the card and you're like it says it here and i'm like and honestly bad on me for not even reading the reference cards i learn by reading rule books so i don't tend to even look at reference cards by the time i'm playing i've usually internalized most of the game that's just how i learn games so i didn't look at them I am moving on. I, unfortunately, I have a final complaint about the game. Um, and this is going to be an issue for some people and not for others. This game is totally, completely, 100% multiplayer solitaire. While playing Dolce, you don't interact with the other players at all. Technically, one player has to call out a card so that everyone else grabs it, but that has no impact on play. The other players at the table... What they're doing has absolutely nothing to do with what you're doing, and there is no way to impact other players at all. And sadly, this is just the nature of the game, but it can become problematic when players are working at different speeds. Mm -hmm. Since the player who is turning their cards can either be racing ahead or be constantly behind with the other players getting frustrated because they just want to move ahead and, and find out what the next mm -hmm. card is. Yeah, if, I, if players have AP, it holds up the whole group, even though it's a simultaneous play game. Like, I honestly think you could play this game so one player could shuffle their deck, give the number order to everyone else, they can put their cards in order, and then just do their own thing, and then compare scores in an hour. <laughs> right? Like, you could almost say the only reason is, is you might spoil because you'd have to look through the cards to know what's coming, which would, but if there's a way to like, you know, hold the cards so you just see the little numbers to sort them, which is probably can be done. Or even as it is, you could have players playing in separate rooms or online, which honestly, I got to say is the bright side of this lack of interaction. This would this be a means, fantastic implementation on BGA. Yes, I agree. But this even not on BGA can be an awesome game to play online at any player count, as long as each person has their own copy of the game. 
or you hand out decks ahead of time. Like, hey, we're going to play this Saturday. Take a set of these cards home in this player board and you take a set of these cards home in this player board. Like, I honestly, you could stream a game of Dolce with 100 players. The streamer just has to read off what cards next each round and it would work. Yep. Hmm. Overall, I like Dolce. It's got a distinctive theme that actually comes out while you play the game. It's at this point, the heaviest bingo style I've played. And it's much deeper than the pretty straightforward rules would seem to indicate. Even describing it above and talking about it, it sounds simpler than it is. Trust me, this is a thinky filler game that my medium to heavy Euro friends, 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 fan friends, fan friends really dig. While there isn't any player interaction to speak of, I really enjoyed trying to figure out the puzzle that is Dolce each time I play. And that's basically what it is. It is a single player puzzle where the player who puzzles the best is going to win the game. Be aware, though, especially for anyone with vision issues, the minimal graphic style can lead to issues. Now, if you're looking for a thinky filler, something to play solo or with medium to heavy Euro fans, you should check out Dolce from Stronghold Games. But if you are expecting a light, light dessert making party game, uh, something fun to play with your friends and socialize while you're playing, you're probably going to want to stay away from this one. That is, unless you're in the mood to try something that requires some thought and lots of planning. But if you're looking for something light, I'd recommend checking out Just Desserts instead. Now, if you like other bingo-style games, again, these are games where everyone deals with the same input each turn and everyone has to use the same resources, you really should check out Dolce. For me, this is the best bingo-based game I've played. For the rest of you, this is very much a try before you buy. Find someone who knows the game well to teach you, ignore the reference sheets until you need them, and dig into building, planting, and harvesting peanuts, cacao, coffee, and vanilla while keeping those chickens well fed. Well, that's it for our review of Dulce, a confectionery empire building engine builder from Stronghold <laughs> Games with surprising depth. Yes. Now, before I go, I do want to invite you to check out my written review of Dolce over at the Tabletop Bellhop blog, where I was able to get into a bit more detail than we were able to cover here tonight. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. As my voice seems to like wander into not being able to pronounce words now, <laughs> I hit the 1120 bad times. Words are hard. <laughs> it's not the coffee. I still have some cookie and cream. Brooklyn cookie and cream. It's oh, a good yeah, one. Yeah. I'm, I'm on, I'm on uh, the, uh, the half calf trying to uh, sleep tonight. Yeah, there is that. <laughs> it probably should be on water by now. So earlier I mentioned that I only got in one game in February, but due to when we recorded last, I actually have a few games to talk about. So just before everyone got sick, Deanna and I spent a couple of days out in Kingsville. And no, we don't think that's where we caught COVID, though it is possible, but due to the incubation time, and when I started Symptoms, which is potentially on that trip. But who knows? It might have been on this trip. But anyway, that doesn't matter. What matters is I played something totally new I've never played before. A game Sean actually loves. Sushi Go. It's no, Sushi Go is a, fav a favorite of mine. So Yeah, and, and Sean's been talking about forever, and I had never actually played it. Or maybe I played it once a long time ago at a public event, but I don't remember. Uh, so the Bandit Groups Brewery, we've talked about how they have Rocco and stuff. Well, they have... This bookshelf, which is actually a secret door, Tori figured that out. I, I, was, I blew my brain because we've been there so many times and Tori <laughs> found the secret door. But the bookshelf actually had new stuff on it. And I was like, oh, awesome. So I actually grabbed like a pile of three or four games to bring back to the table. Um, and then I grabbed the first one. And I read the rules. And I'm like, oh, Anomia takes three players. And I put it back and I put it back on the shelf. Oh, Linky. I've heard of that. Oh, it takes at least three players, which I guess it makes sense. It's a bar. You would expect party games and bigger things. But then off in a corner was here's Sushi Go with the box like ripped in half because that's how people treat these games. And I'm like, oh, that's let's figure out how to play Sushi Go. So I managed to like open it as best I can. And the cards inside are sealed. I'm like, what? So like someone destroyed the package and they went, uh, it's sealed or whatever. I don't even know, which is just sad uh, for one, because like here's ripped up box and well, no one's played it. Here's like like the, the, the best game I've ever seen in there as far as I know, because I hadn't played yet. Um, never played. So I'm like, I'm going to play it. And then at least maybe then if someone opened it, it was like, well, this is sealed. I don't want to open it. Now they'll at least play it. 
And this was Sushi Go, not Sushi Go Party, correct? That's correct. Yeah, just the just the standard. Yeah, like uh, you can find Sushi Go at at like mass market stores here nowadays. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it it's a hobby game, but available regular places. So we played for the first time. I think we played twice. I can't remember now. There there was beer involved. We were at a brewery. Um, solid game. Um, what surprised me is I knew this was a picking class game. This is a game where you get a hand of cards, you choose one to keep, you pass your cards. Well, it's only two player. And and I'm like, is that going to work? But it did. It worked surprisingly well. Um, keeping track of scores was annoying. Is there supposed to be? Oh, you don't have a physical copy, do you? No. Yeah. So I don't know if there's supposed to be a score pad or something. So like we ended up opening up our phones to keep track of the score between rounds. Uh, I will say super cutthroat, though, like with two players, because, well, after you pass your hand once, you now know every card and play for that entire round. And you can basically try to excuse me. You can basically try to come up with a strategy for the whole round. Like, whatever. I I, I played once, so I don't remember all the numbers. Oh, the, the, the wasabi is useless. So I have to make sure not to get the wasabi because there's no sashimi. Oh, there's Mackey rolls, I think, is the one where you have to have the most. And I'm like, OK, there's five Mackey. He hasn't taken one. So if I take one, like you could figure that out. And I found it really neat playing it two players because like that was just really cool because like you you knew and, and you knew when you're getting screwed too. you're like, oh, he didn't take the stupid wasabi. Now I know him and it's going to go back and forth three more times before we're done. Ah, oh, I'm totally getting stuck with that, you know, so that was neat. Uh, interestingly, there are uh, at least one version of the game has uh, um not cribbage uh euchre style scoring cards yeah that would make sense like i i it felt like it should have something because again if you're just a bunch of people at a bar most people aren't going to think open notepad on your phone to keep scoring a game yeah um yeah no so that's fantastic that you finally played it now and i and i can't uh i can't say i'm surprised uh while i haven't played it with less than four players uh working out which cards are likely to come up and which you know are out there is a huge aspect yeah. of the game uh, and that's actually one of the real benefits of Sushi Go Party is yes. because you don't have as much perfect knowledge because there's so many more possible things that could be coming yes. out of each game. Um, you can't you, you don't know you don't know the entire set of cards pretty much uh, early on, um, you know, as easily. Right. Totally fair. I do recommend try it two player once just just to. I said that it almost gets to that chess level because you're like, I know every card and play this round. Right. It's, it's, it's perfect information after round one. Uh, the same trip, we also played multiple rounds of the game. Uh, this has definitely become our go to game to play over drinks. Uh, you can socialize, you can laugh, you can chat, you can watch the game on TV and kind of play cards in between. Um, I, I, this is just a great co-op game. Plays rather well at two, though it's hard. It's, it's easier with more players. Um, while we didn't perfect a game, we didn't get through the entire deck. Uh, at least two of the games we played, we did get down to 10 cards or less, which is technically a win. Um, one of our games, we actually had two cards left in hand, and that was it. Deanna had two cards she couldn't play. So that's actually the closest we've gotten to a perfect game in a long time. I still recommend this one for anyone looking for a lighter card game that requires some thought. Like, it's it's, it's that step above Racco. Well, one game I got to the table finally uh, was Marvel Legendary. Now, oh, this wow. is something that's been a box that's been in the you know the background of of things and things since I moved. Uh, it's been sitting around in my collection for ages, but hadn't actually had the shrink taken off of it. Uh, well, I finally solved that. I was craving a game, and well, I didn't have any other options <laughs> locally, yeah. um, so I cracked it open. And I have to say, as a solo game, it was pretty solid. Uh, okay. But there are definitely some issues, both with the ridiculously oversized six fold board. <laughs> I, this is a six fold board that does not need to be a six fold board. Um, I was trying to play it on my little, um, you know, like coffee, or, uh, TV tray table here. And I opened it up and it just kept opening and opening and opening. It was huge. I, and it, there's a lot of wasted space on the board. Right. Uh, and then the other problem I ran into was the rule book assumes that you're playing it with a group yes and not solo so there is solo is a totally an option and the, it's a variant rule in the back of the book but the teach is very clearly not for a yeah. uh a solo so i had to yes. kind of learn how to play and solo play it all at the same time and figure out you know what what i was missing and, and things like that so i i will give props to um upper deck 
This is what they swap to now. Ah, uh, okay. For legendary games. Yeah, that's so like that's a that lot. Smaller. Was a complaint. Yeah, because uh, many yeah. people had. Yeah, I forget who in our uh, in our Discord was saying the same the same thing. It's you know, yes, the board is definitely oversized. Yes. No, what's interesting about that is what I don't like about that game is the fact it's it's not a cooperative game. Right. That's what I don't like, and you wouldn't have that problem playing solo. So that's kind of fascinating. Yeah. Because I hate the fact that that's not a cooperative game. <laughs> I'm like, why? Why? Why give a winner? And yes, I play with people who are competitive enough to play things that will hurt the group because they don't want you to win. They want to win. Right. And we'll throw the game for the whole group. There are people who play that way. And because you can, and it's honestly encouraged by the game, I don't enjoy legendary very much. Right. Uh, and I have to say, you know, there's a, the, the, the amount of cards that come in the base box, um, while ridiculously small compared to the insert, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> does allow for, uh, a, quite a bit of replayability i haven't actually mm -hmm. gotten it back to the table partially because of space I, do, yeah. I need to figure out a way to to set up the board to do it but um i think there's quite a bit of play before i ever even consider buying the vast number of other oh, decks yeah. that are yes. out there very cool so on our trip what we didn't play is racco which is just notable because lately that's what we play every time uh, amusingly someone uh the concierge there went to the bar, got it, and left it in our room, which I thought was funny. Except I felt bad, because I'm like, I, but that's the game people will play at the bar. No one's going to play Sushi Go. Like, like un, again, realizing people don't want to do work before playing a game, and don't want to read a, like, it, it's it's a fold-out, like, four-page for Sushi Go. It's not long, it's not complex, especially as board games go, but for your average player, compared to someone who grew up playing at Racco, so what I did is I'm like, all right, no one's playing Sushi Go, obviously, because, well, it was shrink. So we swapped, because we were there a couple nights. So I brought the copy of Racco with me when we went to Banded Goose, and I swapped it for the copy of Sushi Go, so we could play Sushi Go at, at, at back in the room. So I thought that was funny. And, and I got to say, that Racco, another indication it's not just us playing it, is Sean's seen it. That is a well-played, well-loved copy of Racco. Uh, next up for me was some Dolce with the extended family. Um, this this was a, a game night over at Brenda's. Uh, Gwen and Brenda have really fallen for this game and have now actually requested I bring it over. So like they were like, oh, can we bring Dolce? So I'm like, oh, who am I to say no? Let's bring Dolce. Um, now we just reviewed this one tonight. I think we've talked about it enough. I don't have to get into more details other than to say that my oldest daughter and mother-in-law are big fans. Fair enough. Now, my last game of the week is Azul Queen's Garden, which I got for my birthday. And people keep asking you when you want to ask the bellhop question is what do you think of Azul Queen's Garden? Because, man, every time I share a picture of this game, someone asked me what I thought. Well, this was a gift and not pile of obligation. And I really wanted to play it. And we were about to head out of town. So I'm, I'm not doing this in like timeline order, obviously. <laughs> um uh, and, and I've been wanting to check it out, so I'm like, forget it. I'm not doing an unboxing. It's my game. I don't have to do it. So I we actually packed this in shrink for a trip. And one of the places we stopped on, on the first day of the trip is we stopped at Auntie Aldo's and caught him. And over some coffee and her amazing Pop-Tarts, uh, I, I can't remember what flavor it was. See, this? it's been a month. Um, Man, they were good. They, they, there was a fruit one Deanna got that was good, and whatever I got was amazing. And I don't remember what it was. Um, I opened it up. And I learned two things. For one, Azul Queen's Garden takes up a lot of room. You have a player board. You have a side board for every player that goes with the player board. You have a central player board. Then you have to put out these hexagonal boards. You are going to have five stacks of them. And then one of those, you're going to spread out uh, based on how many players are playing with. When you play three players... The current rounds active stack could split seven times. Ooh. So you will have seven plus four hexagonal tiles somewhere on your table. People could be drafting from. Wow. I, it's it's it can be a table hog. This is no longer the Azul where we can play it at the bar at the bar. Literally the skinny bar and play it two player. Um, So that that was number one. It takes up too much room. Uh, anti Aldus, while I love it, does not have large tables. It, 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 I kind of, it's not quite the second cup tiny tables, but they're not huge. Uh, there was no way it was going to fit there unless we put some tables together, and I wasn't willing to do that. Second, 
This is by far the most confusing, opaque version of Azul. While the rules sound like they make sense, they kind of don't. And this is the first of the Azul games that felt like it was translated from another language. And I do think they're not English games. I, I'm not positive on that. I think it's Next Move Games is localizing them. I think they're in German originally. Um, maybe they're not. I'm not sure. But I've never had that problem with Azul before. But this one just did not sink in reading the rules. Like, like Deanna filmed me trying to figure this game out. And I guess my facial expressions and look of confusion and being utter, utter bafflement were, were pretty good. I don't know. I think that she had a TikTok account. She'd upload those because like. So Michael Kiesling, the designer of the Azul games, is from uh, Bremen, Germany. Yeah, see, I thought so. So, so I and, and again, it's it's not even that it's badly trained. It's just it's one of those you read it, you're like, well, it sounded like a thing. You reread it, and you're like, oh, I can't picture how that works. So we packed it up. Uh, later in the day, we get to our room at N31. Awesome place. Ask for the, uh, the room number one. It has a jacuzzi that easily fits two people. That alone is enough reason to go there. Um, I was pleased to see they replaced the the tube TV with crappy Rogers basic cable with a smart TV finally. So with a smart TV, I went to YouTube and I found a how to play video for Queen's Garden to watch while well, we kind of took a bit of a break because we didn't we were going to head out later in the night and we kind of both got ready and, you know, I shaved and got dressed up and all that stuff. And watching a video, things started to make sense, but it still wasn't really clear. It wasn't until the next day at the Red Lantern Coffee Co. Awesome place, but closes at four. Uh, we finally sat down and played our first game, and it was rough. There's just something about this version of Azul that is counterintuitive. Uh, the market does not work like the other Azuls. It's, it's not take a tile, everything else dumps in the middle. You don't have that at all. Um, it, 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 the tile placing rules are the most complicated of any Azul yet. And I would say we fought to finish that game. And this is this is so interesting. Now, I, I understand that there's going to be a progression, you know, I, and I think it's interesting that this designer has taken this taking us on this journey from Azul, the original, which is so very accessible and so very easy and has progressed along through levels of complexity. Mm -hmm. But to get to this level that seems to be wildly <laughs> complex compared to the other, that's just interesting. Though, I'll share some more thoughts on it a bit. It's not, I wouldn't say in the end, it's harder than Sintra. So I don't even know if it's a progression. Like I said, it's just. Well, I, I'm going to say based on the weights on Board Game yeah. Geek, it absolutely is. Okay. See, I haven't looked at that yet. So, so side note, cool thing that happened while we're playing the game. Got a couple new listeners to the podcast. There was a couple up ordering coffee, saw us playing games. And came over just to say, it is awesome to see people in public playing board games. That is fantastic. I would have never thought to bring a board game to a coffee shop. That is great. And while I shared, and I'm like, yeah, this is this is what I do. And I try to advocate for games. And one of the reasons I like to play in public is so people like you walk over and go, what are you doing? So I can sell you on the game. Uh, unfortunately, I would invite you to sit down and play this game. But it's our first play and we haven't quite figured it out yet. Or else I probably would have played a game with them. If I had had something lighter, we would have pushed it aside and played a game with this couple. But what was cool is I actually watched them each get out their phones and subscribe to our podcast. So that was pretty awesome. Um, though I did warn them, start with our latest episode and work backwards if you want more. Because <laughs> uh, starting from episode one will be a little rough. And I worry you're going to unsubscribe if you start there. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, Sintra is a two, while uh, Queen's Garden is a three. Oh, so, yeah, that's a big jump. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, while Mo was down for the count... I managed to get out to our monthly event at the barbershop and uh, represent the brand as, you know, to the best of my <laughs> limited abilities. I am not the teacher and, uh, and social butterfly that you are, but I was there. I had the games and uh, I did try to, uh, to interact uh, more than I would normally without someone <laughs> holding a gun to my head. Um, but uh, no, you know, just being out and around the local gamers was nice. The event continues to do well. Uh, and That's as awesome. I was mentioning earlier in the episode, you know, we had that young family out enjoying a variety of games. It was fantastic. We had a smash up uh, expert, you know, for, for lack of a better term, 
a uh, regular Smash Up player who actually had their Smash Up long box oh, in their wow. backpack with them. Um, and I helped them introduce uh, some other people to Disney Smash Up. Um, so they sat down and they were working with others to play Smash Up, but they'd never played the Disney version. Right. Uh, and they were very intrigued as well as being incredibly shocked at the complexity involved yeah. their their thoughts were the disney Sm the disney smash up edition is more complex than the base game or first several expansions wow. in the smash up world wow so these are i mean this so it is wasn't not just us that were like wow this game's got a lot going on oh yeah no this is apparently for from for their feeling it's easier to pick up the base game of smash up and learn it than to learn from disney edition yeah. So it sounds like there might have been a bit of an arms race there because it sounds like the later expansions were this complicated that the game just keeps getting more complicated, which is somewhat scary. Yeah. <laughs> All right. For me, fast forward a month later uh, to Monday, a couple days ago, we're at Brenda's. I brought Azul Queen's Garden. Now, having fought through that first game, I found a pretty good way to teach it so that new players don't have the problems Deanna and I did. Now, while Gwen did keep saying, I'm so confused, or how's it? Do you like the game? I, I like it, but it's confusing um, for at least the first half of the game. And honestly, probably till the last turn, it went pretty well by the end. Um, in the end, both Gwen and Brenda really did enjoy it. Uh, amazingly, with, with how different that game is, our final scores was Brenda, two points lower than Brenda, me, and two points lower than me, Gwen. Like we were, we had, we had a spread of what is that four, six? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't even know. But like, like all our things were right together, which was really impressive because we were all very much doing our own things. I personally, for anyone who does know the game, I tried to play without playing any fives and sixes because fives and sixes are really hard to get into play. And I decided I'm not even going to try. I'm going to play light. And while well, I came in second, whereas, uh, so that didn't work. None of us really focused on. I, I don't know. We haven't figured out the strategy yet. Like that, that's literally it. We haven't quite figured it out. So what I will say um, that was kind of cool is, is it, it started to grow on me at this point. Like it, I, I, I would say I like Azul Queens garden. Uh, it's definitely more opaque than any of the other Azul games. And it's definitely at this point, the hardest one to teach, but I think it's easier to play than Sintra. Like, like there's no weird, moving your marker around and replacing glass tiles that just makes the scoring and everything oh, I, like just difficult. Right. And it's just, it's so different from the other Azul games. I think the biggest problem is reorientating to the way this game works versus the others. For one, you have to pay to play your tiles with other tiles. Like you don't just draft a thing and put it on your board. It goes into your storage board, which is that extra board. And then you have to pay to play it. That alone is so different from the other Azul games that people don't get it. And multiple times people are like, Oh, I'm going to grab this and play it. No, you got to put it on your storage board. Next turn, you can play it. Um, what I wouldn't call this is a welcoming game. As we're talking about earlier, like if you're introducing someone new to games to the Azul series, still stick with the original. The original is great for that. It's got the, the Scrabble scoring, pretty simple to learn drafting system. After that, though, if you're looking for more meat, you might want to try this one. Fair enough. So back at the barbershop bar, uh, again, the event was going really well. We had apples to apples going over with the family. We had uh, Tech and Scott and uh, a couple people playing a whole bunch of different uh, smaller games there we had the betrayal legacy people <laughs> on, they were back <laughs> they were back they got there before anyone else and they did finally finish wow. the game uh they were successful uh so it is now a betrayal game that they can continue playing oh. um it, it it does turn into a game uh and they were uh because they were actually discussing that um uh the 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 gentleman you know uh who were hoping keeps we're hoping wasn't playing that anymore uh so that he could teach other games um, dustin dustin uh, i guess he's moving to ottawa yep uh and so he's gonna leave this game down uh down for to play with this group and then okay. probably do start a new betrayal legacy oh wow with another group up in ottawa i guess they liked it yeah uh we had uh, some folks playing bob ross azul uh, just a bunch of a bunch of different games getting played all over. Cool. Uh, I sat down at one point with uh, the gang and played uh, Ticket to Ride New York, yep. uh, which back 
there somewhere. Yeah, back there. Yep. Um, so yeah, overall, a uh, really fun time, and uh, they got the disco lights off for us. So. Yes, that's I. That was one thing I saw pictures. I'm like, oh, good, no disco lights. I'm, I'm bummed. I'm gonna miss the next one. Like uh, that event is shaping up really good, and I miss playing in public. It was nice getting to play some of the games. No offense to you and Tori and Cat, but to play with different <laughs> people and get yep. some different opinions. Like we, we, I already know what kind of games you like and they like, and sometimes we get some surprises. But it's nice to be able to throw something out that we're like, Dice Kingdoms of Valeria is easy to learn, even for non gamers, and then do it and go, yes, see, it is. It's always kind of nice. As for Azul Queen's Garden, everyone wants my final review. It's going to happen. Um, I need to try it with Tori and Cat. They are the biggest Azul fans I know. So their opinion is going to sway probably my opinion. And while well, I want Sean to try before we do up a formal review. So it's going to be a bit before we get to a formal review on that one. And honestly, it's not obligation. So I could take months or it could happen in a couple weeks. <laughs> uh, but, 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 what else we got going on here? Uh... I think that's all i've got yeah all right well how about a look ahead what do you have planned for the coming weeks uh well the big thing obviously is going to be getting ready for the 200th episode uh getting the giveaway ready to go and sorting out all the prizes and such um there's a lot it's it's kind of ridiculous i gotta admit it's 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 way more than i ever hoped for i really hope we get people out for this like like not not even just showing up for the show that's awesome but like taking part i i, I hope that the these publishers People are going to click on the links, right? We're going to provide one link to each publisher, whatever they want, whether it's their Instagram, their Facebook, their homepage, their latest Kickstarter, whatever they want. Every publisher is going to get one link. I hope people click them and actually interact with the publishers to help thank them for, for doing this. Gaming wise, I, I am hoping to get to see Tori and Kat this Friday. Um, we, As far as I know, there's no indication any of us should be contagious anymore, so it should be safe to get together. Um, so I'm happy that happens. Um, I want to play Azul, Queen's Garden. Um, and then hopefully something off the pile of obligation, which I'll admit I haven't looked at it in a month and a half. Uh, so I don't even know. I, the, 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 there's one game on there, though, I do want, which I'm hoping you and I can get together sometime before next Wednesday and hammer out some more games of Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Um, that is one that um, I, I, we've only ever done the intro games, and I, I want to play the full game. And um, I have stuff to open. And there are more expansions <laughs> that I need to review. So I need to get the base game review out there so I can start reviewing the expansions as well. Yeah, no, actually, I'm really interested in, in getting more into that. Uh, we talked about um, somewhere. Where did we talk about that? That we were, that I was, I was, I've been doing the, I've been, I, I was playing the online version to get a feel yes, for. Which um, didn't. <laughs> not, help. nothing. No, nothing at all. Like, um, completely <laughs> different. Um and personally, I'd love to get Weather Machine up again, but it's not obligation. We've just got too much, too much yeah, lined up right now for obligation. Plus, Deanna's not in any shape to play anything, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. which is why I was talking about playing as well with Tori and Kat. Like, even Monday, I, Deanna did not play with us on, on Monday. Unfortunately, she is not capable of playing board games. And I, there's something else I want to call out while we're still live, is uh, the latest Adventuria Kickstarter is live. So... Head over to Kickstarter. I'll throw a link in the show notes. Go check out the latest Adventuria. We were supposed to be part of this campaign. Um, we were supposed to do a preview of their new system, which is much more RPG based. Uh, I, almost everything we complained about Adventuria um, playing cooperative has been fixed. Um, one of our complaints was progression. All you get is you up your skills. There's now a whole progression system where you level up your character. Uh, the missions now have branching paths. You, you make decisions before you get to the final fight. And things branch and different things will be affected. Not just make a skill check on this. Oh, lose a fate point. Oh, make a skill check on this. Uh, start with one extra card in your hand. Like actual real decisions that matter that impact the story and the gameplay. So I got to say it looks fantastic. I apologize. I I have a copy of the new scenario and I got to look through it. I have the PDF, but we just couldn't fit in playing it with everything that's going on. So So heads up on that. I probably should have thrown that in the announcement section actually tonight. Maybe we'll throw it in next week as well. But the latest Adventuria Kickstarter is live, and we still love the game, and this just looks better. Um, new expansions, new modules using this new system, including a complete rewrite of all the base uh, stories with, uh, with the new system. And speaking of Kickstarters, while we talked about this during the coffee break earlier, yes, the new Hellbringer uh, Kickstarter, or the, the re relaunch, relaunch of Hellbringer has gone live today. There are 19 days left as we record this on March 1st. 
uh, and they were already at $12,000 of their $26,000 total yeah. uh, earlier today. So, And check out our Hellbringer review to see why you should care about that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, then there's unboxings. <laughs> the, the pile of stuff to unbox has grown. Um, uh, due to being ill, I haven't been able to record anything. Um, well, I guess I could have, but no one wanted to hear or see me unboxing anything. I, it, all my boxes would be, I uh, know I'm not even going to yeah, done. Dope. Um, I, plus like in addition to that, I'm, there's three boxes over here, um, of new stuff that's come in that we need to unbox. Uh, so yeah, lots to unbox and then get playing. I have no idea when that's going to happen. Like I, I, I have no clue now. What I will say for those of you here live, stick around. Cause you're going to get to see what are in those three boxes. You get a preview of what's been added to the piles of obligation and what we'll be reviewing and playing in the future. Stick around to get to see that three boxes from three different companies. Well, now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Uh, first off, a big hearty welcome to Dean Graham, the latest tabletop bellhop Patreon patron. Welcome. Thanks, Dean. David Miller Jr., thank you. In the chat room tonight, well, actually, we've quite a few of the people are in the chat room tonight, which is awesome. Brian Kurtz, thank you, Brian. Uh, Jeff, Sheila, and Clara Seuss, thank you. So I think Jeff's now away putting Clara to bed. Yeah. Pat and Tori, hope to see you Friday. It's been too long. It always feels wrong when it's, we're apart this long. Well, that was the double bell. The, the slightly quieter, lower tone double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to drop that portcullis, because well, Ryan's in the chat, and he likes the portcullis. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as tabletopbellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. If you think what we've been doing, it would be awesome if you stop by patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and tip your bellhop. Even today, I sent out 45 minutes of bonus audio to our awesome Patreon patron. I actually gave that to everyone. You didn't even have to be a hotel guest because I feel bad that it's been a month. So I gave that bonus audio to absolutely everyone. Well, that wraps up the time we have tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. And you're welcome to stick around for our penthouse suite after show and the uncrating of some games. Yes. <laughs> for the Tabletop Unpacking. Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.